Well, welcome everybody to the Shelburne Planning Commission, Thursday, the 23rd of August. We'll call this meeting to order. The uh, first item is approval of the agenda. Um, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. And a second. Moved by Kate, seconded by Asim. Any discussion? Any? Does it look good? Yeah. All right. All in favor of the agenda as stands? Aye. Aye. All right. Hi, Stephen. Okay. So that brings us into the comprehensive plan discussion. And I think we're going to start with a welcome and introduction, similar to last time. Is that? Well, you weren't here last time. I, but I saw it all, and it looked wonderful. <laughs> well, since you're here as the chair, you can welcome everyone. I can certainly. Well, everybody, thank you for coming out. And for those here who were here last time as well, it's, it's really important to get public feedback to these types of things. Uh, there, there has been a lot of effort put into the town plan, as is. The, uh, we've been working through some drafts, so any inputs that you have are greatly welcome. We want to make sure that we get everybody's input. Um, and I think last time, did you have... I got some slides. You just went through those yeah. slides, right, that are in here? Okay, I'm... I'm Dean Pierce, and I'm going to run through some slides. If you give me just one sec to switch over. Uh, as the agenda indicates, uh, I'm going to be talking about a couple of different, well, it wouldn't necessarily be clear, but I'm going to be talking about a couple of different things. Starting with what requirements are in place for a town plan. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about what a town plan is. And I've said this before, so apologies if you were here last time or if you watched it on TV or read an article. The plans for a municipality are sometimes called a blueprint or a roadmap. It's essentially a document that <coughs> describes how a community wishes to grow or what it would like the future to, to be like. Um, and that's kind of a simple idea conceptually. But a plan for a municipality also has other roles that it fills that are legal in nature. Um, so it's got, it's got some burden that it's carrying as well as being a document that describes what people would like their community to be like. Shelburne has had a comprehensive plan since the 1960s. Um, not a lot of other communities in Vermont can talk, uh, can claim to have had a municipal plan for as many years as Shelburne has had one. One thing about community plans is that um, almost since their inception, they've had an expiration date. And the term for uh, the shelf life of a comprehensive plan has been five years. That's in the process of changing. But as things stand right now, Shelburne has a comprehensive plan. And because it was adopted in February of 2014, that means that it will expire in February of 2019. Uh, starting with the next town plan, the comprehensive plan will have a shelf life longer. It'll be eight years. Um, the Planning Commission has been working on the update of the current town plan for about, about two years. The contents of the plan are spelled out, in, whoa, spelled out in statute, the basic requirements, and there are some parts of a comprehensive plan that are more optional in nature or parts of the planning process that are a bit more optional. If you decide to do them, you get some benefits for doing them. There are lots of different sections that a comprehensive plan is supposed to have. There's supposed to be a transportation section and a housing section and a future land use section. That's all spelled in state law. The state law also says you can mix and match them whatever way that you would like. So. Towns are not bound to have them in a particular order or anything like that. There are also a whole series of state planning goals that when a municipality decides that it's going to have a comprehensive plan, again, this document that helps describe what it would like to be like in the future, it's supposed to follow these state planning goals. If there's an instance where a state planning goal doesn't seem to apply, well, the municipality can say, here are the reasons why this state goal don't apply. There's a, a part of state law that says that a state agency has to prepare this document that's called the planning manual. Uh, and the planning manual is supposed to help guide communities when they're updating their plans or preparing the plans. And that document 
gives advice to municipalities. And I would say that the Planning Commission, when it was starting work on the update, had some of this in, in, in mind, although um, I think we'd agree that still working on trying to fulfill those recommendations. One of those recommendations is that the comprehensive plan should really focus on achieving the vision for the future. Don't spend a lot of space or time describing or documenting the past or the present. The recommendation is also to structure the plan around big ideas. Another suggestion is to use maps and graphics uh, and images. Um, and another recommendation is take out stuff that's that's unnecessary. So those are some recommendations, and when we plow ahead, um, we will we'll see how successful we've been. I added this slide since the last meeting because I was thinking about just how many meetings and discussions have been taking place since the update process started, and I I basically stopped counting after 30. Um, which is a lot of meetings. And these are meetings that every time the Planning Commission has a session, that the planning plan update was part of the agenda, it's noticed in the, in the website, it's on front porch forum, so people know about it. Some of them were attended by members of the public, some not. But 30 meetings over close to two years, it's a, it's a lot of meetings and it's a lot of discussion. There were also some meetings that were held by committees that helped um, make recommendations to the Planning Commission about different sections. There's an energy subcommittee that was created. There's a housing subcommittee. Um, Pam Brain is here from that group today. There's the Natural Resources Committee. There's the Historic Preservation and Review Committee. So there were additional meetings that I'm not even counting in that 30 that are part of what I would think of as public involvement, involvement of people beyond the members of the Planning Commission. And we're doing these two sessions in August here, we, the 9th, we did one a couple of weeks ago, and doing them tonight, and early, we did one earlier this afternoon. And um, by no means is this the end of the public input. Um, this is kind of a, an, there's an emphasis being placed on public input at this stage, but there will be more opportunities for public input before the Planning Commission has a document that it presents at a public hearing. And we'll talk a little bit more about the adoption process um, towards the end of the night. Before a town plan can become official, it has to go through a process where there are formal public hearings by the Planning Commission, and there are at least two public hearings by the Select Board. I'm gonna skip over the next slide quickly because we'll talk about that later. I wanted, before I get into the contents of the current plan, to touch on some of the things that were said at the most recent sessions. These are just, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, um, because there were a lot of comments, but, these are some of the things I wrote down or summarized from the things that I had seen written down. Uh, and you can read them, but they re-emphasize uh, or reinforce some of the things that are in the proposed plan, such as that scenic resources in the town are important and they need to be protected. There's some recognition the people that pick up this document and look at it and see all of the recommendations, and there are lots of recommendations that somehow the Planning Commission has to find a way to prioritize them because there are just too many to be able to work with practically. Um, there were some really specific ideas, like there should be a skating rink uh, in the center of the village, um, or a community center, or and a community center. Um, there were people that were, that were jazzed or were excited by the idea of placemaking. Placemaking is a concept that is included in the town plan, and we can talk a little bit about, more about that. There was someone who made a comment about how we might need to look at the rural parts of the town differently. We talk about the cultural resources within the center of the town, the historic resources, and, and they're thinking about maybe that idea can be applied to rural parts of the town. Um, there were people that said there needs to be more public involvement. And an example of that was to, to involve businesses in visioning for the Route 7 corridor. There were more than one person that was talking about just how much Shelburne is changing and has changed. People talking about getting ways to get cars off the road, encourage transit. And another concept that I think of as kind of important is trying to find ways to integrate the, the plan and the recommendations it has with local decision making. So helping influence decisions like what goes in the capital plan, where we spend money, where do we you know, invest in improvements, and decisions made by bodies like the select board. So that's what all I think I'm going to say before shifting gears just a little bit to what the actual 
plan says. And the sessions that we're having tonight and we had two weeks ago divided the town plan up into, I'll call them batches or sections. And um, tonight we're gonna have a, a focus on one grouping. Um, it doesn't mean we can't talk about the plan entirely, but the idea is we'll try to focus on certain chapters. But before I do that, I wanted just to summarize broad strokes what some of the changes are between the old town plan and the new town plan. I, the copies of the, of the new town plan are floating around there somewhere, but the current town plan looks like this. It's really black and white and boring and yes. And, and it's the new version is graphically um, much more appealing. There's a lot more um, that people would be, there would be reasons to pick it up and read it, I think, because of the design. So that's a significant change. Um, the plan as it's being drafted right now is a single volume. The current town plan is in two sections plus maps. Um, I had mentioned the idea of placemaking that seemed to get some support at the earlier sessions, and there is an emphasis on placemaking in the current plan. There's also more emphasis, I would say, on conservation and identifying areas that are conserved or protected to some degree or other and showing those on the future land use map. There's more language about preserving natural resources uh, in the natural resources section and in the, in the plan overall. There's also a lot more than there was several years ago about stormwater. Stormwater is a topic that I think a lot of people realize um, has been a it's a topic that's been very significant in Vermont in the last several years. And then there will be updated maps. The current town plan has several maps. Many of them have not been updated in many years, and the current, uh, the updated plan will have new maps. I'll make the point now, the maps that are in the document are placeholders, they're not the final version. So I'm kind of, it's a little bit of a bait and switch. Um, the, the maps that are in there are holding spaces from the maps that are going to be finalized this fall. So, like I said, state law says all the different sections that a town plans to ha has to have, they can be organized any way the community wants. This is the table of contents. We've talked about half of these chapters um, at the last session. So, tonight we're going to be zeroing in on transportation, historic and cultural resources, housing, public facilities, which is part of uh, the growth and development section, energy and telecommunications. And I'm gonna just try to get things, get through things quickly so that people can then start making comments. Um, I'm gonna say a few words about each section, draw attention to where there are big differences between the old and the new. Um, you aren't gonna be able to read these from where you sit, but, but if you want a paper copy, you might be able to read the PowerPoint, but you can certainly see it in the document. But listen, uh, I'll convey the basic idea. So when it comes to the transportation se section, as an example, the transportation section is one of the sections that is uh, proposed to be changed more than, than some others, and it really has been rewritten from the start. So on the left, you can see the existing text. And on the right is the new proposed, and the things that are in boxes, it's essentially new. And there is a, um, I would describe it as a new orientation included in the, the transportation section. Um, that orientation emphasizes what might be thought of as a multimodal transportation system, transportation not just focused on cars, but transportation that focuses on things that have engines in them as well as things that are people powered. So bicycles, pedestrians um, get more attention in the current transport in the proposed transportation plan than in the current plan. I think I'll just leave it at that. To illustrate, I'm just going to give people a quick taste. If you haven't looked at the plan, you can glance. These are uh, example goals or sample goals and objectives, but some of this stuff is pretty predictable or straightforward. 
transportation goal, recognized transportation planning as a fundamental element of placemaking and a catalyst for enhancing and achieving desired community form and outcomes. So to me, that's saying the goal is to recognize that we're, we're, we're planning for transportation facilities because of how we live. We shouldn't live because of how we plan for our transportation facilities, if, if that makes any sense. Um, we should be planning our transportation to support the way that we live and the way that we want to live. Uh, another, you know, an objective, not another goal, but is to promote development that's compact, walkable, interconnected, safe, and features public spaces that foster social engagement and economic productivity. That's a, an objective that is in the proposed transportation section that you wouldn't find in every transportation section, in every transportation plan in Vermont, because they wouldn't necessarily have that orientation. But I think it, it conveys what's going on here. Moving on, historic and cultural resources. Um, this is a section that isn't changing dramatically. Um, so the introduction uh, to the goals, objectives, and policies is largely intact. And so I won't say much more about that. I will show you some samples of what the goal uh, or a, a goal in the historic and cultural resource section says. This is one that's a, probably a bit more predictable. Identify, preserve, and protect the character and defining elements of the built environment and landscape. And it lists what those are, historic structures, historic areas, significant views, and so on. And then the objective is, is really to, to make that happen, conserve those resources, do something about those resources, protect them. Housing is a section that um, has seen some change, maybe not quite as much as the transportation section or the natural resources section, but there is, has been a, a rewriting of the in introduction, um, and there are additional statements included in the policy section. Um, but the housing section is, I think, trying to convey the idea of doing a better job at the things that we're hoping to do, namely create additional opportunities for affordable housing, having more types of housing available for a broad spectrum of the population. And just to illustrate a goal, have an adequate supply of housing to accommodate a diverse array of residents, essentially what I was saying just a second ago. Um, there are some objectives like the one that's at the bottom of this slide that are new numerical. Um, the reference to 80% of county median is just part of the state definition of affordable housing. But we can talk a little bit more about that if there are questions. Public facilities, as I said earlier, is part of the growth and development section. Last time there was more discussion of the growth <coughs> Uh, growth part. There wasn't a whole lot of discussion of economic development, but that was also on the agenda for the last time. The public facilities part of the growth and development section um, is where we would be stating what it is that we want when it comes to water and sewer and libraries and things like that. Um, one of the new pieces or new aspects of this section is really about coordinating with other communities. So Shelburne, as some people realize, has been working more with South Burlington on issues having to do with stormwater. And it also sounds like we're going to be doing some of that with wastewater. So coordinating with other municipalities, that's a new part. But a part of it that's not really new is this idea that Shelburne shouldn't grow so fast that we overburden or, our, or stretch our wastewater services or our water services, so that growth and public facilities should be coming along at about the same rate. One shouldn't outpace the other. Just to flash on the screen some of the goals for public facilities. Uh, well, I should say that there's a, there's a supplemental, there's a vision statement at the beginning of the plan in the public facilities section. There's a, its own little supplemental vision statement uh, that reinforces the idea that I just said of the growth and the facilities being available in line. Um, but the goal is one that's been in the plan in some form for quite a few years. Provide in a cost-effective manner utilities, facilities, and services consistent with the plan rates of growth. 
And then the action that's at the bottom is, is something that's new that, uh, or it's been modified slightly, but it just gets at this idea. We may not, it may not be the most sensible thing for the town to be providing a new service on, on its own. It may make more sense to coordinate on delivering that service by working with a neighbor town. Energy is uh, a section that I've mentioned before uh, has, has grown and shrunk and now is growing again. In the past, uh, or the current plan, the energy section is not very exhaustive, but before the previous plan, uh, it was a longer section. The proposed language in the energy section, a lot of the material is there because of what I was referring to earlier when I said there are optional elements of a comprehensive plan. State law says you have to meet these basic requirements in an energy section, but state law is also saying that if you want to have a certain benefit, and I'll talk about it in a little bit, your plan needs to have more information in it. So a quick, quick little aside having to do with the energy section of the town plan. I said when I started that town plans are more than just a vision document. They're, they have this weight on their shoulders that's kind of legal in nature. And one of the things that's on their shoulder is that a town plan can be used when major projects are reviewed in Act 250. And a town plan can be reviewed or used when there are projects being, that let's say there's a very large power line upgrade or a proposal for a wind farm or a large solar facility, the town plan can be considered in that process. So the optional stuff that I'm talking about is as a result of a law that said, towns, if you want your town plan to have more weight in this process, your energy section needs to have more things in it. So a lot of the new material is in the plan or is proposed to be in the plan so that Shelburne's town plan has more influence in those processes. Hopefully that's clear enough. Just list quickly before I turn things back over. Um, energy goals to encourage better use of energy by individuals, businesses, or organizations. Decrease the use of fossil fuels for heating that's an objective that's included in the draft. I should say that some of this policy language is really the result of, there's a state law that, there are a couple of different state laws, but one of the state laws says that the state of Vermont should, um, is aiming to have 90% of its electric supply provided by renewable sources by the year 2050. So we don't have, we've got 32 years to get to 90% of our energy supply by renewables. So that means converting from certain sources of energy that aren't renewable onto renewable. And so an objective like decreasing the use of fossil fuels for heating is part of that. We, we're using a lot of energy that comes from non-renewable sources, and so we're going to have to decouple. We're going to have to find other ways to heat our homes and to move our vehicles if we're going to meet that goal, essentially. Um, the next goal, the second from the bottom, define areas suitable for sustainable energy generation. The state isn't going to be able to meet the goal of 90% renewables by 2050 unless there are more renewable sources. So one of the ideas that communities have to wrestle with as well, where would be the best places if there's going to be renewable generation in the community? So that's what that second goal goes to. Okay, I don't need to read each of these. So I think, I think this is the last one I'm gonna talk about before we just shift gears. Um, towers and tele telecommunications is not one of the, it's not a section that's required by state law. Uh, Shelburne added to the town plan a section on, tele, uh, on towers and telecommunications a few years ago as a result of concerns that came from a proposed cell tower or data tower. There was actually one that was proposed and one and not built. It was withdrawn. And then there was one that was built. Um, but just like I was describing with large energy projects and the town plan having a role and in maybe influencing the decision, there's something similar that goes on with telecommunications and towers, 
And so this section was added because the town was hoping to have more voice in this state review process for telecommunications. So that's why it's there. As part of this update, there is very little that's proposed to be changed about that section. Very little, if any. I think, oh, sorry. Sample goals, what, what are in that, uh, things that are in that. Ensure that the, pro this one is a little bit more legal or legalistic. As you read this, you might sense a bit of a difference between some of the earlier ones. And like I said, it was written be in response to this um, proposed tower. So people were thinking more legalistically. Ensure that the proliferation of facilities and towers uh, does not have a material adverse effect on the goals, policies, and objectives of the plan. People in Shelburne don't want there to be so many towers across the landscape that it's going to uh, change people's perceptions of Shelburne, um, affect the land values, and so on. Um, then the last goal, the second goal there, ensure that the Public Utility Commission considers the plan. That's, that's what I was referring to earlier. So. That's the highlight of the sections that we're talking about tonight. Uh, we can certainly come back if the, if the conversation runs thin after talking about those particular sections, we can go on to the sections that were discussed last time. But I think if there, well, let me stop. Are there any questions about any of the things that I showed you? And if not, then maybe Jason can turn things back. Yeah, so with that, thank you, Dean. Um, so those are the sections that we're looking at, looking to highlight today. I'm not sure uh, the best way of going about this other than to open the floor and if anybody has any question, pressing concerns or questions, just raise a hand, we'll get you a microphone and we'll start working through it. Oh, yeah, and I had it down tonight for a follow-up meeting. Hmm. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> okay, Is no. Maybe in the next room? I have no idea. Hey, could be. I don't think it's been scheduled. Oh. Yeah. No, well, because they said it would be posted on front page forum yeah, if it wasn't uh, gonna be. All right. So it's it. Sure. Hi. Um, so my name is Ellen Arapakis. I, I just came because um, my big concern in living in Shelburne, and I, I live on Marset Road, is just the issue of, of safety and traffic. And I know that this is something that has been discussed before. And I also know there's an ad hoc committee, and they've tried to put in some crosswalks, which is great. Um, and I'm glad to see language in the planning document about concerns for different modes of transportation that moving forward, we're not just thinking about um, accommodating cars. Because I, I think about like some of the nicest places to go visit across the world. And most of those places are places that are human centered and not traffic centered. So I'm very concerned about the traffic. I know that Marset and, and Falls Road are, are east-west cut-throughs. I saw something not in this today's Shelburne News, but in last week's, it made some comment that there was a traffic study and that since 2009, it said that traffic has increased 3% every year. That was in the article, which seemed a lot, because then by 2019, that would be 30%. So I'm very happy to see the crosswalks. I really wish something a little bit more, um, I don't want to use the word aggressive, but substantive would be done so that within our village, 
it really would be a safe place for everyone. I'm noticing a lot of young families with children and dogs moving in, and it seems kind of strange to me that on some streets going out, like Irish Hill further out, if you look at the proximity and density of houses along the road, um, where it's 35 miles per hour, there are hardly any driveways, and the houses are far back from the road. And then you get right into the village, and then in a half-mile stretch, you've got 15 driveways, people very close, children and dogs, and it's still the same speed limit. Um, also, Marset Road is, I think it's designated part of the Champlain bikeway. Cyclists travel through. It would be great if the streets could be narrowed. There could be some kind of physical barrier. I would like to be able to ride my bike to places and drive less, but I don't think it's safe to. So I guess I would just urge uh, more action on that issue. That's the one issue I feel really passionate about. Anybody else? Thank you. Yeah, just before your comment, I would say uh, thanks for that. There is. There was a lot of work done on the transportation section, and Kate, thanks for a lot of driving on that. Um, but there, there are a lot of recommended actions around that, and that is definitely something that is a priority. And, you know, it may come from a lot of people like me who are working and don't have time to come to all these meetings, but it's, it's a huge thing. I, I don't want to have to move. Sometimes I feel like I'm being driven out. Certainly. And, and what I would recommend is once we get past the, the whole plan revision process and that's gone, then we get back to our regularly scheduled programming, which is working with the rules and, and that sort of thing. So I, I know that there will be some things that happen, so just keep an eye out. And if there's a topic of interest that you want to speak up for, it's always helpful to hear. OK, I'm Bruce. Bruce Nunziata, I live on Falls Road. Um, I spent a couple hours today looking at some of the older um, similar plans that this is uh, in line to replace. And what really surprised me is, going back as much as 20, 30 years, really how little has changed in what we're saying we're going to do. You know, we say that we're going to make pedestrians a priority rather than vehicles, as if we just discovered that great idea last night. But we've been saying that for 30 years. I don't see that we're doing it. Um, maybe, you know, in the 50s, we had plans that didn't address pedestrians and cyclists. But it's been a while now that we've recognized the need. You know, a bit of the jargon has changed. Um, something I saw today, and it was actually a landscaping plan from 1998, and they talk about cobbled landings where you cross the road from a crosswalk, and it's, I guess, a cobbling effect that we now do with sort of a synthetic brick thing. And I think it's a great idea, and we could use tons of it. But it just struck me that only the, the jargon has changed, but you know we're still talking about it, and we're not doing it. And I totally agree with the lady that just spoke before me. Um, I think the village is grossly neglected. And I'd have to say, as good as this plan is, and as um, modernized as it is, it almost seems like there's a de-emphasis of the village. Um, I like the bike paths and the interconnectivity and that whole concept is great, but I think you've got to get the village and the dense um, concentration of people and pedestrians taken care of first. seems a little crazy to have these paths built to a destination that's in disarray. We've got old broken down sidewalks, speeding, um, and, and sidewalks without protection in the village for decades. And, and Dean knows this very well because I tell him all the time. And he's quite aware that we've been having this conversation. Different people, kids have grown up since the 80s. Literally, the 80s have been talking about the conditions that this lady just spoke of with their kids in the village, um, I'd like to see not only it, it emphasized in a plan, I'd like to see a plan that actually happens and becomes a reality so this doesn't sit on the shelf next to the one from 1998 and, and so forth. Yeah, wel welcome to comment. And I, 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 I would say that things have happened, but it, things happen, they don't happen really quickly. And I can say that through just ongoing conversations around, like there, we have a paths committee in town that spends a lot of time on this. And I can say that generally when things are proposed, anybody whose property gets affected speaks up to say, no, we don't want that. 
So it really does become, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see a civil discussion around what we can do that makes the most sense. The approach that, that this commission has taken and what we've tried to incorporate into the plan is um, concepts of when there's new development, making sure that there's easements for paths and walkways and what you do with open space and things that would align toward that direction. And again, keeping in mind that we don't, we don't exactly move or turn on a dime. Um, these things can take time, but it's socializing those ideas and having people understand that, yes, if a path happens to go by your property or something, it's not the end of the world because it's balancing out a big safety component. And, and I'm, I'm not saying I disagree with the paths or, or I minimize the efforts, but I'm saying that I think first before you deal with those issues, you've got to get a handle on what's going on right here in the densely populated residential village. And then from there, you work your way out and start taking care of these other things. I just And Andrew, just incidentally, the, the microphone is more for the TV. Oh, you, you okay. won't hear the speakers um, or anything. But as you were pointing out, I mean, in the village, there's not the issue of having to deal with property owners. The sidewalks are there. The roadway is there. I feel like it's, I mean, obviously I don't understand this completely, but it's already Shelburne Town Roadway. What property owner would have to give, give you permission to narrow in the heart of the village, narrow the roadways? to slow traffic down, putting in on part of the roadway some kind of physical barrier so you would actually have a true b bike lane where people and especially children on their bikes would be safe. Sure, and I, and I know that they're experimenting with some things like that in Burlington now. Um, so there's... They're doing uh, it. Sure, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the article I read is that they were temporarily doing it through October. But the, these are things that they're doing to explore and see what works. This definitely has been a topic. We've talked about Marset in the past. We've talked about other areas. We just had a discussion two or three meetings ago about what to do in the village and extending a sidewalk and how to go about doing that. There are residences in the village, so um, I can't speak to the details of what property needs to be addressed, but if any place where you're talking about widening or adding anything in, you're impacting somebody's property, be it a business or a resident. So there is some coordination that needs to take place and that's what we're hoping to drive towards. Jason, is that something that in our purview to actually, I mean, we had talked about you know, like setting widths of roadways and stuff like that. Um, but is that ours or is that the, the select board that does anybody well, the, know? Is it, I mean, is that something that we can actually any, change any, bylaw? Any change, any bylaw changes that come through the planning commission we go through, we debate it, we figure out. We, we would submit, as we're doing with the uh, rural area zoning change that's later on the agenda tonight, we debate it, evaluate everything, and then at the end of that discussion, we put together a change report, uh, or a bylaw change report that basically pulls in, here are the areas referenced in the town plan that would support this change, and then we submit that report to the select board who then would review it, and they have the final say. So. Yes, we have a lot of influence over what goes to the select board, board for decision, but at the end of the day, it's their decision on whether or not it gets approved. But we can so, work on things like public work standards and stuff like that. We can, we, that's, that's our task to uh, look into. And, you know, um, I, that's been something I've long hoped to be able to do, to work with a consultant on that, because I agree a, a zillion percent with everybody here that, you know, there's way too much preference given to uh, movement of automobiles and and they have very generous space to move around in and you know at the expense of pedestrians and cyclists so so some of that is getting public work standards that really specify how the roads our public routes can be um, re uh, you know redesigned to accommodate all users so the, the Dean you're probably the best one to answer this further like uh, how would that occur? How, what's the, what is the mechanism so to address what these folks are the looking for? Because I totally agree with, with what they're saying. So Jason's right. The, the Planning Commission has uh, a role and responsibility for proposing bylaw changes, zoning subdivision regulations. Um, those aren't the, the things that normally determine things like the width 
of an existing road. Now it does, it does, those things do determine new roads. So you can make recommendations and help influence what the subdivisions will require as far as the width of a new street. But I don't think that's the issue that we're talking about. We're talking about the existing streets and highways. And the control over that is the select board. The select board has the authority over the streets. We have a staff, we have a highway uh, superintendent, and, and he's the person who carries out that responsibility day to day. The, the explicit statutory authority of the Planning Commission that I would say you should use is the authority to do studies. And so you, you can't tell somebody what to do uh, as far as the policy, but you can do a study that makes it very clear what they should do. And you would hope that they would adopt a change in the policy. But in the end, it's going to be the select board that would decide what the policy is going to be regarding the highways, the mm -hmm. existing highways. So I don't, I don't know that there's an easy way or that there's any way that the Planning Commission could say it must be this on the existing highways. However, Bruce is right, there have been studies that go back to the 30s, or not to the 30s, they go back 30 years, and those studies talk about narrowing the widths of roads and having bulb outs and more pedestrian accommodation in them. Those studies haven't been successful in changing the policy. That's the basic mechanism, is to have something that convinces people that the right thing to do is X. And you have that authority. So that would be something that, that we would ask for that study and the select board would approve it? Is that the? You'd have to figure out who's going to do it, what will it cost, who's going to pay, if you've got a grant, the select board support doing the grant. I mean, it, it will take. I don't know that there's going to be a way for the Planning Commission to do a study that no one wants you to do. Right. So it would have to come from the public, I guess, mm -hmm. to, to ask the select board to do the study or to look at it further? Yeah, that would certainly help. Or, I mean, I, I understand there, there are some people who may have taken the view that there have been studies that say how we should behave and we're not following those studies, and so we need to change our behavior. We don't need another study. Others might say, we can benefit from a process where we study and we use today's information and we come to a conclusion, and maybe it's the same conclusion. Narrower lanes, crosswalks, all dots, whatever. Or maybe slightly different. So the, the results that you mentioned, the crosswalks and things, are those, those are Things that have occurred because people have been going in front of the select board and basically encouraging them to do something. So and it's been an ongoing thing for a couple of years. And that's where you get quicker activity and maybe in the long yeah, term. Yeah, we, we, we just we just make policy, which is, you know, kind of, you know, nice, but yeah. it, it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't lead to, you know, material change in that in your lives. So um, sorry, I wish we were that powerful, but we're not. Um, but, you know, what I just wanted to say, you know, one of the things that uh, we had the Shelburne days, you know, and I spoke with a ton of people and I'm in addition to doing planning commission, I'm also on the bike and pedestrian paths committee. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's it, it's coming up in conversation, this idea of having more funding provided for these kinds of things. So we don't have to wait for, you know, five years to get some little teeny little, little, you know, connecting bit put in, you know, because we didn't have the matching funds or something like that. So I would just encourage everybody to start thinking about whether or not that would be something they could support um, because, you know, this, this, we, you know, that means we're gonna have to shell out for it, right? But, you know, South Burlington just passed the penny for paths thing the other day, you know, I mean, maybe it's time for Shelburne to sort of think a little more out of the box on some of these things. Because otherwise, you know, we're just there like beggars, you know, trying to, you know, the, it, and to the select board's defense, there are a lot of competing, uh, you know, uh, costs uh, uh, that they have to manage. And, you know, there's limited, you know, funding for these sorts of things. So. Um, so I, I, I just think it's time for us, if we really want this as a community, and I certainly do, um, to, you know, start to be willing to be, you know, to pay for it up front, you know. To go to the select board and eventually propose something that would be a, a budget item on a, on a vote. 
something, I think there, there are a variety of different ways that other communities have handled it. I mean, some places have a direct appropriation for, uh, for sidewalks every year. Other places like South Burlington are doing the penny for paths thing, you know. Um, uh, there can be a ballot item similar to like what's the open space fund, how we raise uh, funds for that. There's, I think there's many different ways to do it. Um, and there's also when, you know, new development goes in, there are these things called impact fees where a developer can be um, required to pay into a fund. So maybe we don't want to have, you know, it's not a huge priority, as Bruce was saying, to have a piece of sidewalk or path built you know, wherever that place is, but, 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 but this could be put into a fund and then used to finance something that we desperately want, you know, in the village or something like that. So they're just, there, there are ways to do it, but you know, it's again, it's a squeaky wheel thing, right? You know, they have to know that, that this is a priority of, of residents. So, um, I just want to put that out there. And I, I would add as far as this process goes though, is that, um, having these things as goals, objectives, and recommended actions in the plan, that ha having that framework to facilitate decisions being made in that direction is important. So it would be harder to make a bylaw change if the town plan doesn't support it. Uh, so there is, an, there is an element of what this process does is justify the ability to make changes later. If I can, I would like to respond to something along the lines of a question you had as far as the studies. I think the studies have been done. Mm -hmm. I think um, there's an engineering standard of certain things like the width of a road. This isn't the first time this issue has been looked at. So we know what needs to be done. The people in the village pedestrian group worked with local motion, a group with great expertise. So we know what needs to be done. I think the only thing that's been lacking has been the will to do it. It's been a ma matter of town manager and select boards, you know, maybe paying lip service, but, you know, there's stuff we want to get done. Um, redoing an entire neighborhood, redoing Falls Road is a huge expense. But the thing is, right now, with these new concepts that local motion uses, they can be done relatively inexpensively. There's just certain mm -hmm. techniques that they've learned. You know, a lot of cities are scrapped for money, and they, they come up with these things. And Burlington is doing these things, and we did some pop-out ups here in, in <coughs> Shelburne with local motion. So we're not even asking for a lot of money. I mean, down the road, long-term plans, it'd be great to make it you know, a beautiful boulevard or something. But in the meantime, just to make it safe, it can be done with a lot less money than I see the select board spending on things that aren't budgeted for, let's put it that way. Okay. Gail? I have one. <laughs> Gail Albert. And um, I had three things on um, transportation that I wanted to mention. One, one of them was when I read over the whole thing, there was no objective two, and I wondered if something got left out or if that was just an oversight in the counting. So you, is oh, it leaving out anything we're talking that, about? Yeah, just in the slides that, Dean, that you had, you were pulling out some highlights, right? Sorry. Yeah, so that, that was just showing exec, objective one and three, but there's mm -hmm. definitely a two, and there might, oh, okay. might be some additional ones. Um, the other thing um, had to do with things that I know are already in the plan um, about requiring walking paths and parks to be a requirement in some way, even um, with transfer of rights or something like that. Um, but make it a requirement of any new developments that come in that there be some of those things um, that require connectivity with future adjoining pro projects. Um, and I think you've addressed that. Um, perhaps in a different section, I didn't see it in the transportation section that I can remember. And then my third thing was just um, going back to the recent um, Southern Gateway study, and I know that that isn't something that goes into the plan, but that is another study that has been completed, and I think that we're looking for economic development, and we're looking to avoid accidents, and knowing working on Route 7, I know that there are car accidents right in front of our place probably once a week. And um, the last one was just this week. So um, whatever can be said in the plan that would give um, power to the select board to follow through on some of those ideas that came up through the Gateway Study, I think would promote economic development and safety. Thank you. 
that's a good point. Thank you. Hi. Hi, I'm Dorothea Pinar. I'm just basically here to answer questions if there's anything uh, in the uh, about the historic preservation section. It pretty much didn't change a whole lot, just kind of firmed up some wording. My concern is, has been stated many times, um, on the map we have it zoned as a the um, number one growth area. That's always a challenge to help preserve our cultural resources and have it the number one growth area. Zoning of that is very tricky. How do you have that kind of density and have it fit into a village that was never a, you know, like a Virgins type of village. It was a houses, it was farms basically, and then infill. It's, it, it has a different character than a lot of, you know, Main Street kinds of uh, towns. And we're also very concerned about zoning, um, encouraging the teardown issue. We, have, we do have buildings that are deteriorated, um, that are very significant. Um, so we're, it's a challenge for us to try to incentivize people to uh, preserve those buildings. You know, there's at least four, maybe five. We've already had teardowns uh, in the last couple of years. We're going to see a lot more. And my concern as a preservationist is to say, at what point do we lose our status as a National Register district because we've lost integrity? So when you're planning, you know, we have the goals, it's well stated, it's very firm, but now when you sort of look towards growth, so it's an overlapping of growth and it's overlapping of transportation, all these issues come to a head in the village. Um, we have to be aware that it can change quickly. Um, having worked in some cities, seeing things change very quickly uh, in a bad way uh, because of, uh, of, the t of the teardown issue. So, you, you know, if, if the land's more valuable than the property, it's going to go. It's gonna go. And, and we're getting a lot of pressure from developers to do that. So um, I guess as we're working this plan and, and putting it in place, implementing it. That number one growth area makes me always a little nervous. I, I, with the form-based code, I saw the number one growth area really should be more along the corridor of Route 7 to me, uh, with the transportation um, being a broader street and that sort of thing. That it, it makes more sense to me to extend that as a corridor of growth and to be really careful about how we deal with the uh, zoning of the village. That's a good point. Now, I would just comment that recalling the details when we were going through that section, I think we did fairly certain that we put in some things to improve the town's flexibility of being able to have some in input to older buildings that might, the decision it would be easier financially to just say get rid of them. I mean, if you're a property owner and you own something that it's going to cost a ton to make it look good, you're probably not going to do it if you don't have those funds. So, um, and I don't recall exactly what we put in there, but off the top of my head, I think there was having a, uh, there was investigating having funds to be able to help people in that situation, seeking ways of giving the town first right of refusal before something like that happens. Um, there was definitely discussion around it though. We hope to be also the commission is really thinking about this, looking and investigating, and, and hope to be able to put out uh, suggestions to you. A absolutely, and I, I think, yeah, we there was a lot of your inputs to what went into that section. Um, so if there's any language that can be tightened up or something, um, that that'd be welcome. I think the situation that we find ourselves in is we can't just make de facto statements that this is the way it needs to be, but we can craft language to facilitate being able to do that, which can be really aggravating, but that's how things tend to work. Uh, Steve Mayfield, Bay Road, um, Shelburne Country Store, Country Christmas Lofts, et cetera, and so on. Um, going back to around 7.05 tonight, um, back to something Dean was talking about, which was there's about 30 some odd planning board meetings, 25 or so committee meetings, um, 350 or so meetings in this room between all the other exemptions. Is there any way of making these meetings interactive in the future? Um, you have it going out 
Would there be some way of having it coming in as well? Whether it was somebody sitting up there with a Twitter phone or somebody with a laptop that could take email questions or things so that those of us that are on other things going on at the same time that are very interested in what's going on during the planning meetings, that are interested in going on with the select board meetings, the PATH meetings, the historic meetings, people with children, people that are still at their job when the meeting starts, <laughs> still at their job when the meeting ends, um, are able to participate in more of the meetings. I try and get here as much as I can. Um, I attend some of the select board meetings. I attend a few of the planning meetings. I've attended one or two of the committee meetings. There's just not that many hours in the day. Um, but I want to be a part of the plan. I want to be a part of the select board meeting. And I can't get here for all of them. And I'm always afraid that the last meeting you had was the one that dealt with what I needed to deal <laughs> with. I know. When did you talk about that part of the plan that was going down Falls Road as opposed to Bay Road as opposed to the Route 7 corridor that all interfered with me? Um, and I read it after the fact. Um, Dean's very good, actually, at sending me things when he thinks it's really going to affect us. Um, but there's a few thousand people in the town, I'm sure, that's outside the purview. Um, is there a way of making this go in both directions? And I know you're not going to give me an answer tonight. Um, just something to think about that it's a high tech world now and God knows I couldn't do it in your shoes, but would there be a way in the future of making that happen so that you could get more input from the 6,000 people in town instead of the same 30 that come to every meeting? Yeah. I mean, well, speaking personally, I'd, I'd love to see something like that. I, I immediately started thinking that the 10-minute uh, open to the public session that we have could end up getting out of control really fast. But um, there is whenever, and this is something we'll be talking about later in terms of suggestions for grants to pursue, I know that there was talk at one point of pursuing a, having somebody investigate what could be done to have an active polling process. Um, these are just things that have come up over the last year, uh, which from my perspective, and I, there's a lot of factors that would go into this, but having something even just on the town website where there could be a town question of the week or something just to be able to garner input and just take the pulse of what, what people think. I think that most people are online now, and if not, then there's the library, so it would be a, a, a reasonably comprehensive way of gaining feedback. Um, but so those are things that, that cross every now and then, but at the same time, and Dean might have thoughts on this, but there, there is the limit of what budgets are available for infrastructure. And I don't know what would be involved with making something like that. Very interactive. Could yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> or is that something that, I mean, can people email you, Dean? Well, all of our what email addresses you? technically are out, or at least the chairs yeah, of committees and stuff. I think I'm understanding what you're getting at, Steve, and, and I have seen at least one community, it was a while ago, where they had community access TV, and it did allow them to have a phone number, and I guess somebody answered a phone <laughs> when the phone <laughs> rang. Um, this was several years ago, and they may not do it anymore, but I mean, the, the principle is not all that complicated, but there are some probably some some technical issues that uh, what Jason is saying. Well, you know, can you? How do you handle up the open to the public section if someone is not actually here? But if the planning commission said, "Hey, from now on, we're going to have a laptop open and it's going to have a." Twitter feed and there's a specific hashtag and if you use that hashtag someone is monitoring it and I mean it's it's really going to be something that the, the commission would have to decide that makes sense to do and it's not overwhelming and it has as many benefits as it has burdens and it, and it I mean, is there are different ways you could do it yeah once we get past the plan I, I think that's a great idea and it is something to talk through because yeah we could implement something really quick where we just say hey you know, the meeting's here, the, the here's our 10 minute window. If you post your questions ahead of time, we'll get through as many as we can and then we have to move on in the agenda. 
So I, there's things that could be done, I'm sure. We just Well, and people could comment on it, agenda items, too, if that was something. Right. I'm just thinking, Steve, if there was something that you specifically knew was on the agenda and you wanted to talk about it, mm -hmm. if, if there was that, that would offer a way to, for you to say, here, hey, this is what I think about, you know, thus and such topic. Right. Actually, yeah. I would say, like, some of the other towns have to increase the public participation, also, like, instituted lotteries. So you basically spread the message and then ask people to participate and then you kind of like give them participation in a lottery so that they can win prizes and that has increased the participation <laughs> rates by 30, 40 percent. Yeah. Uh, so there are like many passive citizens who just kind of like think about participating, but these kind of uh, initiatives can really help mm -hmm. uh, with the Twitter and some of these smart city movements. So like in Chicago and I think in New York, some boroughs have done this kind of uh, cool. Kind of like a smart city uh, initiative that help people like win iPads if they participate or so. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's is the same thing that Asim is talking about, but I've been at conferences where they give you a website that you can tune into on your phone and you yeah. can post a question in a relevant part of the meeting and somebody only needs to be there to monitor what the question yeah, is and, so you and can and the participate. Question, the person whose question generates the most discussion, interactive discussion, wins the iPad. So <laughs> I think there is like a lot of ways that you can do that. And there are some technical hurdles. I mean, speaking from the, the last meeting that we had, I was out of town but was able to dial in. And uh, kudos to VCAM. Everything that I heard online was fantastic, but I was also on the phone, which was a, somewhere between a 10 and 30 second delay. Um, or, well, the phone was real time, the online was, was delayed, um, and it was difficult to hear on the phone. So switching back and forth, like it's, it's just curious where if somebody's following a meeting online at home, but they're delayed, it wouldn't necessarily be a real time thing. So there's some things to think about, but that's a great idea. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Pam Brennan, I'm with the uh, Housing Committee, and um, before I talk about housing stuff, just want to touch on this, uh, the online interactive, I mean, I attend webinars all the time at my desk at work and, you know, you type in a question and they go through the questions as they can and, you know, inevitably there's more questions than they have time for, but, you know, it definitely allows people to, to participate but not physically be in the room. So I do think this is, mm -hmm. that it's a great idea and something that could be done. Um, but I was here tonight to talk about the housing section, and I just wanted to compliment you guys on the plan in general. It, it looks really great, and um, I, I think that uh, the content is really good. Uh, we did submit some comments, and I, I wanted to make sure that you guys have seen them. Um, and I don't know, they're kind of specific, so I didn't know if you want me to go through them or if you wanted to ask me some questions about um, the comments that we sent in. They did not get them. <laughs> they, don't, they don't have them in the packet for okay. tonight. Okay. Um, but they have received a summary of the comments at previous meetings. And so the specific written comments submitted by email are coming next in line. <laughs> okay. All right. So I don't know if I don't really want to bore everybody with all of our comments right now unless well, you want me to highlight, hi highlight them. Sure. All right. So you have the housing section handy? <laughs> uh, not, not the full one, but we could bring it up. Waiting for that. If I could just add one more thing um, on accessibility. Um, I know in the Natural Resources Committee, at one point we had a member who had a hearing impairment and he left the committee because there was no way for him to be able to um, really follow the conversation. And so if there's a, a place in the plan for technology um, to allow for greater um, inclusion, I think that any kind of technology that allows for more accessibility would be really a positive. Thank you. That's a good idea. 
Thanks, Dean. Um, okay, so uh, in the intro, um, the very last sentence of the introduction, where it starts with, uh, it is important that Shelburne experiment with, uh, we propose that you uh, remove the reference to rural hamlets and um, a potential re rewording would be, it is important that Shelburne explores planning concepts which help to preserve forests, view sheds, wildlife corridors, and water quality. We felt that um, having hamlets in there sort of just restricts, you know, it seems like we should be open to more ideas than just rural hamlets. Um, so then on the next page, on the objectives page, So objective number three, um, we were proposing that um, you end the first sentence at um, expansion of community facilities and services, and then instead of the end of that sentence have over the 10 year period ending in 2016, the town added an average of just under 40 new housing units each year. Um, that's a reference to the housing booklet that we put together, uh, looking at uh, the, the growth over the, actually more than 10 years, but we just figured 10 years was enough of a, a time frame. Uh, and then in number four, just a, a spelling error on the last sentence. I think it should be through, not thorough. Uh, perpetual workforce housing. I think. Um, and then, yeah. Um, and then on number nine, uh, let's see. We thought that the word uh, require seemed kind of aggressive, um, especially given that the objective begins with the word promote. And so we thought maybe um, you might want to reword that. And then let's see, on the actions page, the recommended actions. Uh, so action number three, oh. <laughs> uh, number three, uh, we thought the word mandate uh, seemed rather strong and thought that perhaps using promote or propose might be better and a possible rewording would be consider adopting the state energy stretch code into zoning regulations for new constructions, renovations, and additions. And number eight, uh, we thought that maybe we should uh, add, there should be some language in there about mandating uh, density bonuses and but suggesting a housing trust fund for those fees might be a good thing to do with those density bonuses. And then on number nine, uh, just wanted to add in at the very end of uh, number nine, in, where it says for construction of affordable housing, it should also read and workforce housing. And those are our comments. Where's that? Uh, I think it should be growth areas, probably, because there's two, right? Good comments. Yeah, thank you. Why, um, why do you side away from um, having us put in the plan uh, a recommended action to, to mandate something? Because um, we can promote all kinds of things, um, but 
if w one of the goals of the energy section, for instance, is to have sustainable and renewable energy provided and, and so forth, um, unless there are mandates, how, how would it be done? was more the way the sentence began. Um, let me just find that comment again. Start with yeah, so either, so it seems seemed like either you need to get rid of mandate or you need to change, uh, like promote, um, oh wait, is that not the? Well, and I, yeah, two, two considerations while that get, comes up. My my read was that the what was being promoted was separate from what was being mandated. Similar theme, but they were different things. Okay. Um, mandating of solar, though, I, I mean, I, I think we debated this quite heavily. I, I, I think that that could certainly get into trouble where if you have a house that's completely shaded, it makes no sense to put solar on it. Um, Part of the impetus was to try to get people to situate their houses so they would be acceptable mm -hmm. for solar. Right. We had that discussion. I don't know if that made it in, but. And that would be, um, this is pertaining to, to new construction. Right. Where people do have a choice of which way they orient their roof slopes and how close they go to property lines with, like, trees on the, on the south side. Mm -hmm. um, but, and it's, it's this balance that yeah. we've, going through in, in all our discussions is, is where is the wording too weak where nothing gets done and where is it too strong where it seems like it's overbearing and prohibits people from doing things but there um but i think the a recommended action just by the fact in my opinion just by the fact that it says it's a recommended action it means we're through this plan we're promoting that Okay. But it's not up to us to be mandating that. It's a recommended action. And, and that's where understanding the, the context of the process is helpful. So if, if we were to end up debating a change to the bylaws that let's say that we would be pushing for a mandate to add solar to all new development, then that's what would go into the bylaw change report after we've done all our debate it references all of the places from the plan that supports what it is that we're trying to do and then that gets packaged up and again goes to the select board um there's it's there's there would be public hearings on it from a planning commission standpoint and again from a select board perspective and personally i could see like a, a mandate for rooftop solar could run into trouble where if for some reason you're just in a shaded area, you're not going to have that. So language would, would need to be softened. There would need to be um, a way to navigate down that path. But one of the challenges that we had was if the language isn't strong enough in the first place, then it doesn't have enough teeth to even get traction to, I, to say I, anything. I can totally see this so, Good point now. You guys are saying this is recommended, and it may not be what ends up in the zoning change bylaw change but at least you have this mm -hmm. this action in here right and this is also around and we have the energy section as well but around some of the state goals that we have yeah and that that gets really dicey too because there's one one line of thinking that is we don't need to do commercial solar or anything like that in shelburne because we've got scenic views but at the same time there needs to be a balance somewhere and if it does if it's not going to come from solar where can it come from and it just this is designed in some places to be a bit provocative to force the conversation mm -hmm. um, not to say that any one of us necessarily says no this is exactly what needs to happen and that's that okay thank you for explaining mm -hmm. that thanks for comments yeah and i think just to clarify and i I'm not trusting my memory much anymore, but the, the promote one, which, which one was that? Uh, that? That was, that. I, I think it was, ah, oh, right. Uh, in, num in number eight, we were saying mandate density bonuses. And then and, plural. But it was areas. actually number three where we were saying instead of using mandate, we were saying perhaps use promote or propose. 
And then we had a suggested rewording where we kind of bring in the, ener the state energy code. Uh. So in a way, we were, we were like rewriting everything that you'd written there, <laughs> <laughs> saying, just go with what the state said. <laughs> And we probably did that six times <laughs> to, get, to get to what we had. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so these comments then, um, is this something that we'd formally be? You'll get them. In we'll get them. Yeah. In. This is to receive as much as you can. Absolutely. Yeah. Next, next meeting. Maybe Start thinking about it. it. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, thank you for those. Thank you for all your work on the housing committee. Absolutely. It's a good group. Any other uh, talking points or questions? I, I had a thought um, in the growth and development section um, about educational facilities. Um, and what I thought we might want to say is something like, um, educational facilities, when modified, shall be designed to be flexible to meet evolving needs. Um, because we've seen such interesting um, flux in the school age population, and um, there's always a hue and cry when you want to make changes in the buildings. And so if we design the spaces to be flexible so that they can be easily moved around, it may um, reduce the amount of kickback um, when we need to make changes. So I just want to make sure I'm following. That, so that's like designing with modular scalability in mind? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Not being an architect, maybe Steve can say something different. Um, but making spaces so that they can be, they can be modified um, readily to accommodate larger groups or smaller groups, making them more flexible when when such kinds of things have to happen. I think that makes sense. Um, I, I know that um, the folks that do design the schools are always trying to keep that in mind. There have been lots of different ways that's been tried. And I think the community school kind of suffered from some of that, uh, like the ultimate uh, flexibility kind of thing um, that's, that, that didn't seem to be working. But there are, everybody's always trying. It's worth putting in the, the, the plan. I, I think that's a good comment. Yeah, so I, I just, I suppose, I want to just go back and see what we did. But yeah, that's a good point. Might be worth uh, adding something specific along those lines. Yeah. Anything, uh, any other topics? Definitely want to make sure we get all the feedback we can, but I would not be disappointed if uh, if we wrapped earlier because we've got a lot of other things on the agenda. <laughs> We're looking good. All right. Well, yeah. Appreciate everybody's feedback. That's this is good. We're keep the process going. And. Going to just briefly outline the schedule. Sure, I was just going to ask to, what's next. But this is conceptual. I hope you can see it from here. Maybe I'll pull it up. Uh, the schedule is driven by the deadline, as I think I said. The The plan will expire in February of 2019, uh, about the middle of the month, if there's no new plan adopted. So the uh, select board would need to have its two public hearings completed before then if the deadline is going to be met. The planning commission will have to have a public hearing before the select board hearings if the select board is going to be on schedule. The uh, Maybe better to just show this on paper rather than 
Okay. So that's probably actually better than this. <laughs> I should have started, stayed where I started. So here we are in August with these informal public information sessions. We're down here looking at February of 2019 as the deadline. As I said, the select board has to have two public hearings. If we're going to meet a mid-February deadline, the select board's second hearing will need to be in the early part of February. The schedule conceptually would have their first public hearing a little bit before that at the end of January. If we work back from that, we're looking at the document that is the result of the Planning Commission's hearings going to the Select Board sometime in early December. When the Select Board receives the document, um, they can't immediately bring it to the public. They have to warn a public hearing. They need a little bit of time to digest it. Um, so they would be getting it in early December, which would mean, bless you, that the Planning Commission is going to have its hearing in early November. So if we work back from that, we're looking at September and October being the, the crunch time for the Planning Commission to put together the document in its hearing format. Um, that doesn't mean that it's going to be absolutely perfect, but it really should represent the document and the policies that the Planning Commission is trying to promote. The document can be changed when the, when the public hearing is held. The Planning Commission could make some changes in response to comments, as I was explaining this afternoon to the group. If 10 people walked in with 10 great ideas at the, at the public hearing and the Planning Commission agreed that those 10 ideas should be incorporated into the plan, they could incorporate them into the plan and it would have no impact on the schedule. Where it gets a little bit... Uh, more difficult is once you get to the select board phase because at the select board phase if there are changes made to the plan there has to be another public hearing so the planning commission is very very hopeful that in addition to members of the public making their thoughts and ideas known that we also hear from the select board and there has been some discussion or some consideration that perhaps the planning commission and the select board would have a joint meeting in early september or mid-september those are the broad strokes of the timeline. If the deadline isn't met, it's not the end of the world. It does have some implications. It means things like zoning changes can't happen until a new TAN plan is in effect. Um, it means things like certain grant applications where you get extra points for having a plan. You wouldn't get those extra points. And it means a few other things, such as in Act 250 and the 248 process. Anyway, questions about the schedule? Yeah, Wendy. For maps. Uh, Wendy Seville, pedestrian, uh, Bike and Pedestrian Paths Committee. Um, for maps to be included, um, how, do, how do presenting those maps fit into that schedule? So the, the maps that are part of the plan need to be in the document. So. When the plan, when the, I, the, the, the best practice isn't to do bait and switch. It isn't to go into a public hearing with a document that you know you're going to need to do more things to or deliberately add to. So the Planning Commission, when it has its hearing draft, should try to have the maps in the document. It doesn't mean that they couldn't receive a comment to add a map, that there's some map that someone comes to the meeting and says, let's add this map, and people say, that's a great idea, and you could add it to the document. But the purpose of warning the public hearing is so that people know what it is that's being considered and what there's a really good chance will be sent on to the select board. If you were looking at a situation where something really controversial was going to be added at the last minute before it goes to the select board, maybe just because you could send it directly to the select board, it might not be a good idea to do that, and maybe there should be another hearing. But ideally, or necessarily, the plan maps should be in the document when it's warned for public hearing. Can I just ask you to, um, so to explain um, how, once this plan is implemented, zoning changes that reflect some of the co new concepts that are in the plan um, would occur and how people would go about um, if they were looking for zoning changes, for instance. Do you know what I mean? Um, 
the new plan has a lot of new concepts in it. And um, I think many times people come to meetings and may not be completely aware of what the zoning regulations implications are and might want them changed. And so if that were to happen and the new plan will uh, generate new zoning regulations and that's probably the next task you have when you finish the plan. So what's the process of um, updating the zoning regulations to reflect the new plan once it's implemented? Well, and as observed earlier, there, there are some concepts in the plan that haven't changed in decades. Uh, and a lot of that things just come down to priorities. So there could be some really ad good ideas in the plan that just were deprioritized over in favor of other things. Oh, well, the, the process in general is once the plan is formalized, then we'd go through the process of taking issue by issue and eventually having a bylaw change report and submitting that to the select board. So we would just iterate through that. Th this plan, as you read through it, has tons of recommended actions. I would not venture to even remotely assume that we'd get through all those things in the next several years. Uh, it's just more that's that's providing the guideline that should color any decisions that are made is the spirit of the plan. Um, so that that's why that's important. But the the any any zoning law changes or any of that, it would be the same process it's always been. We're just using this plan, ho hopefully having a few more hooks that will enable some of the ideas to have more teeth and get passed. But Gail, if you have something that you want to propose as a zoning change, bring it to us because you Absolutely. don't have to wait for the plan to be adopted in order to make a, a proposal for a zoning plan. And we can look at it once we're through the bulk of this work, we'll have time to start looking at those things. So you don't have to wait. You can just, if you have one in mind. And, and as an example, the next topic we're going to be talking about is a zoning change that started from residents submitting an idea and there's been a lot of debate over it for a long time and I think we're getting close. And, and I, I'm aware of that, but I think that a lot of people are not. And that was the, the notion for my question. Yeah, I, I imagine that it usually is, residents don't really pay too much attention about this until they're trying to do something that they run up against a wall that there's a rule that says they can't do it, um, which is how things go. <laughs> Over the last few cycles of plan updates, the updated plan has um, resulted in a lot of work and a lot of time spent on the bylaws. This is a situation that is going to be a little tricky because there's not going to be a lot of time available for the Planning Commission to work on zoning changes uh, before the deadline is actually reached, and all's well as long as the de as long as the deadline is reached. And if the deadline isn't reached, then um, there'll have to be a little pause on zoning changes. But the process of, of identifying what the zoning changes should be, which ones are attacked first, will depend on a lot of different things. Sometimes they'll cluster together. Sometimes one particular issue will be the most pressing issue. Sometimes it's seen as better to just you know work on some housekeeping things because the big, tough issues are going to take a little while take some time before people reach consensus on what the changes should actually be. And, and I would also just to say it out loud, and I know we've talked about this, is any opportunity that we have to bump any of these dates up a little bit to give the select board more time is something that we'd be looking to pursue because there's not a whole lot of wiggle room. Um, all right. Well, with that, are we good to move on to zoning? I think. All right. Well, yeah, thank you, everybody, for your input. You're certainly welcome to stay. No obligation. So, all right. Um, So do you want to queue up the twenty-one ten thirty-six? I'm gonna to need to remember where I put my notes. Ah, thank you. <laughs> In your packets, there was a memorandum for me that attempted to show people uh, the progression of this this 
uh, possible zoning change, which Jason, as you just pointed out, has its origins in a request from a particular a couple of, of Shelburne residents. Um, the initial idea was uh, resulted in the proposal to modify the definition of developable land by removing one of the three elements, the slope element, and for the benefit of everyone else, I can have this on the screen momentarily. But um, while I'm doing that, there was some, uh, what would happen as a result of the, the removal of that part of the definition is that there would be um, opportunities for some people who have lots that are too small to subdivide, they would have the ability to subdivide. And the other aspect of the proposed change would be, along with changing the definition of developable land area, there would be a change in the regs so that anytime someone was subdividing in the rural zoning district, the development would be reviewed as a planned unit development. So that would be something that would mean that if you're doing a subdivision in the part of the town that's outside of the sewer service area, it would be a, a more complicated process. It would be a development review process that really focuses on preserving natural resources uh, and would also have more things in it that uh, require people to cluster or encourage them to cluster the lots and not develop an entire parcel with what some people might call cookie cutter development. Now, the latest additions to the proposal um, and, and the text in the memo that would accomplish requiring everything to be a PUD is in this 340. The new material is as a result of some of um, Dick Elkin's concerns, and I think maybe Dick, you can jump in, but 1930.3a uh, is a paragraph where there's a series of specific requirements. Um, the idea that I believe Dick has would be to say that the open space requirement for PUDs would be 60%, and that would be an increase from what is currently in effect. What is it now, 50? Uh, it's 33. And it would rewrite the, uh, yeah, so, and I should say, as, it, as I have understood it, this would be affecting the open space requirement in the rural district. It doesn't change the space, open space requirement in other districts. So this is where it's shown here in C. So it's currently all districts have a 33% open space requirement. That would be the case that they still have a 33% requirement, but the rural district would bump up to 60. And then the last piece would be to modify what we call the, the buffer. Around every PUD in Shelburne, there's supposed to be this buffer space. It's kind of like a, a larger than normal setback. Um, currently, in the rural district, um, that amount is um, 50 feet. I'm sorry, 75 feet, and it would be reduced to 50 feet under this. Currently, 75, and under this proposal, would be dropped to 50. And that would mean that there's a bit more flexibility when, if you're required to have more of the rural land kept open, that might mean that your your houses are shifted to the, to the uh, desirable building sites. Those desirable building sites that don't have an impact on natural resources might end up being relatively close to a property line. In the past or in some other places in, the, in Shelburne, the perimeter buffer um, makes it so that the development is very linear. It's in a row. And by reducing the perimeter buffer, it wouldn't have to be linear. It could be truly clustered. So. Those are the pieces, but maybe Dick, it's better for you to chime in. I think you laid it out pretty well. Um, the 60 was an arbitrary number. Um, 
could be 50, could be uh, Wilson to 75. Um, so it's strictly ar an arbitrary number. Um, I felt like there were a couple of little changes, but other than that, I think Dean covered it. Is, is it. is there any questions, I guess? So that 60% that would just mean that up to 40% of the, the lot could actually be developed, like right, building. Right, right. And they would still it. have the, well, depending on what what the open space is made up of, for instance, if it were agriculture, they could still do agriculture on that parcel, but it would be an undevelopable parcel right. from that point forward. Or they may want, it may end up being buffers on stream sides or something. Some of it might be restricted from use. Um, and it can be titled uh, to uh, an environmental group if they, you know, however it goes. How, how does that uh, right now work? How does it get con conveyed? I think most... Does it get uh, conveyed to the town or...? I only know of three developments and they're just open space lots. Um, are actually, they're not, they're not open space lots. That's one of the reasons for I, that I wanted to make this change. Um, there's one subdivision that was done a 10 acre lot that became a nine acre lot and a one acre lot so the open space land is theoretically open space but it's a it's a contiguous lot to the original lot i believe and there so, was something in there that said um that you passed by in there it said how that open space is oh there it is a 4a okay yeah, so there is no requirement, and, and this wasn't something that was part of the proposal or Dick's ideas that I was, I was aware of, that uh, right now the regs say you need, to, you need to identify an area that's open space. It can be as a separate lot, but it doesn't have to be. Some, some communities will have regulations that say the open space lot must be a separate lot, but Shelburne's history has been to say that the open space area that is the requirement doesn't have to be a separate lot. It could be part of one of the lots that's in the development. It seems a lot cleaner if it's just an open space lot to me. I mean, that's what we do in Westford. Yeah, I think I think a lot of communities do do it because it's it's cleaner that way. Um, but then that requires a subdivision, and they're doing a subdivision anyway. Yeah, the only reason why this is happening is because. But yeah. So depending on what what makes the most sense for the plot, you could still have. I mean, it could be jagged edges and jigsaw puzzle piece of land as part of the overall PUD that is allocated to open space. I quite get that. So we have. I can, I, so I can maybe explain something a real life example. We have a PUD in Westford, where um, think of the entire thing as open space. It has roads going going through it to connect, right? And then the the building envelopes are like little squares within mm -hmm. this much larger yacht lot. So everything is technically open space except for their building envelopes. So. And that's because this was an area that had a lot of water resources and other issues. And it right. was, you know, it was a, a way to get to the buildable parts of the lot, but to protect the vast majority of the area that was not uh, suitable for building. Part, part of what I was promoting was to make it easier to cluster the lots closer to the road, maybe share a driveway in partially part of the way. Mm -hmm. And you know, shorter roads, less permeable, impermeable surfaces. Uh, that was part of the thought process. So, to, to use an example, and hopefully use easy math, if there was a 100-acre lot, um, 60 acres of that under this would be open space, and mm -hmm. then the remaining 40 acres would have however many houses as part of that PUD would fit there, but it's not just the houses in their building envelope, but it would also be any fenced in yards or anything like that. Because open space would be open space. That wouldn't be something that somebody could fence in and say, well, open this space is... would be for non-development. So you wouldn't do any 
kind of construction on it. If it were agriculture, you'd fence it in. But it's not like it's not like if you had ten houses, you have ten open space lots. You have an open space lot. Maybe uh, there may be a river on the border, so you may have the DRB may decide a hundred feet of the bank will be open space buffer. There could be other uh, things that might need to be or want to be concerned. Um, Avoiding building on steep slopes is helps uh, with stormwater, um, so that may come into play. Uh, there's a number of other different things. If it's agriculture, um, they propose. Well, I'm not sure. I should probably have read back through our requirements, but it seemed like there was an emphasis on protecting agricultural land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not very first paragraph. Right. So if it were ag land, then they would ask that it not be built on, that you would build in a tree line or something. Mm -hmm. the, the way I, I kind of see this is that there's, there's two parts. There's one that's a response part to the Meuniers mm -hmm. um, to allow somebody who was kind of encumbered when the, um, the lot size went down from 10 acres to 5 acres, and then these other restrictions came in and and to, we can help them out in a way that's mm -hmm. separate from somebody else and helping somebody else that it wants to develop a 150 acre parcel or subdivide whatever um is it possible that we we address them both like i, I like what you're proposing but i do feel like uh those slopes of 15 percent or more should still be un developable land for a big development like well if somebody wants to build, if somebody wants to put 75 houses on a big piece of land that's still left over if we exclude that 15 percent slope area they may all of a sudden put 120 houses on there and I don't think as far as what we're trying to do with the rural area that we should be promoting greater development and making a little city out there um, so I, I would like to keep that, the slopes of 15% or more, in uh, 2110.36 developable land definition. But in order to help out, I, I, can, I think we should help out folks that want to just make two lots out of one so that, like in the case of the Muniers, they could stay on one lot. Um, it's what they're saying. But, um, but it... It's not going to have a great impact by adding, you know, hundreds of more houses. It's really just doing two houses. So, could we, could we, like, reword that two one one zero point three six developable land a slopes of fifteen percent or more, and just add like comma except for lots left than fi less than fifteen acres. So anybody that wants to make two lots out of one. And have two houses where one would be allowed because they have a steep. They happen to have a steep slope. We're allowing them to do that. We're allowing them to do a little small subdivision of their own. And saying less than 15 acres. So if they have 14.9, they wouldn't be able to do three lots right. because. So we we don't. I mean, I'm just setting that as saying, okay, let somebody split a 14.9 acre lot into two rather than than keeping it as one if they just happen to have some steep slopes in there i'm i'm mostly curious the uh the slope thing for whatever reason has just really stuck with me i i understand that it's it's in there as part of a uh density control issue but um when I think of building into slopes, and, and maybe this changes with scale, but, but I think of you can get a lot of efficiencies out of building into a slope, um, couldn't you, in terms of regulating temperatures inside and, and that sort of thing? Like I, I understand the, the argument of not wanting to build on a slope because there are drainage and stormwater concerns, but my thought there is that you could handle that in other ways as well. I, I'm just I'm, I'm curious about the, for some reason, the slope thing is just really gotten into my head is I, I don't understand why we're restricting it from a construction perspective when this was written this we didn't it was for density we right? didn't yeah right yeah. we didn't restrict slope growth on slopes but now 
I think there is a reason to do it because of stormwater. And I think that's what other towns, why they're restricting steep slopes as well, is if you, you know, if you built on the bottom of the slope, you're not really increasing a lot of stormwater and you could do what you were talking about. But if you build on top, you're speeding up the water, leaving the site. And that's, that's the issue for stormwater. But and and I guess and not to split hairs, but you could you could build on the top of a hill that has a really steep slope, and that stormwater is still all going to rush down the hill. It doesn't matter if you're building into the hill at the top or toward the bottom. Right. And there's ways to mitigate the effect of of stormwater runoff. With um, okay, you know best the terms, but uh, the nice way to do a detention basin that's a rain garden or whatever. They're, they're called. There's different terms for, for them on how to mitigate that. But well, that's a good point, uh, Jason. Um, I think it's, I, th I, I think that we should be allowing people to build on a slope of 15% or greater. But I thought this was just as far as what's con considered developable land from a density standpoint. Yeah, we're talking I, about I two different things. Right, yeah, and I, mean, I get that. I'm yeah, just trying to distinguish. And but uh, yeah. Dean, according to the bylaws, you can you can build on a on a 15 percent slope or more. Isn't isn't that correct? You just can't count count it as a developable can, part of the site. You can the way it is. You can you, you can build it. Allowed. That's what I right. my so understanding is. The use of developable land area is primarily this density adjustment. When someone is doing a subdivision, if they had a lot of areas with slope, it's possible that the Development Review Board would have a condition that says you can't build on those slopes over there because of stormwater, like Dick is saying. So it'll but be up to the engineer. It'll be up to the engineers to determine if they can maintain the amount of water that flows off the slope the way it is. Right. And th those are the things that I think we'd be focusing on, right? If you're you're trying to make sure that you're not putting too much bad runoff or, or you're retaining it somewhere yeah like any development plan isn't just going to be contributing to the problem in a negative way but is handling the issue but you you had said something about the if for the larger developments if you're allowed to build on slopes that 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 could make a difference on how many units go in and i maybe my brain's just not fast enough to keep up with it I, i'm trying to rationalize that is that are, are you just saying that maintaining that for the larger ones does retain it from a density control thing so if you have a if you have a hundred acre plot and half of it is on a 15 percent slope then you've already just said all right well you can only build on the half that doesn't have the slope I, yeah, I guess maybe um, maybe I don't have it right, but I, I the way I was wording or understanding this was that you you can't count those um, those slopes and the wetlands and and floodplains For as lands. part of your Just developable like area when you're trying to calculate the number of units you could put, you know, taking your hundred acres and dividing it by five acres, you know, right. to get twenty houses you can put on the slope, but because it's set up as a PUD. Um, I, my understanding of the zoning regs is that you can still build on those slopes. You just can't count them as far as calculating the density that you're allowed to, to put on that whole piece of property. And correct me if I'm I'm wrong. No, I, I think you got. I think I got, got it right. If, uh, yeah, unless the DRD was to attach a condition that says you can't build then you could build on the 15% slope. And as you say, they would just come out of the development potential. So this this hypothetical 100-acre lot that you talked about, if, if half of it is um, slopes, wetlands, floodplain, then you don't have a 100-acre lot for development purposes. You have a 50-acre lot for development purposes. But like Stephen is saying, if 10 of those acres are at 15 percent slope and the they're the best places to put the house sites and they have the least impact on other resources maybe where you end up with your house sites okay so we still wouldn't be restricting that plan it's just it would be a density measure at the larger 
right? Even Williston, Maybe. that does restrict building on 15% slopes, will allow, if there's no more place else to build, they will allow you to build there. I'm not, I'm not saying that's what we should do. I'm just saying that's, you know, they, you but can so build on slopes. You can now, and, and the way it's written right now, you will be able to. So I'm thinking we should kind of honor the original intent of those being excluded for larger developments um, as a means of density control in the rural areas, which we're, we're trying to do in the, in the comprehensive plan, uh, limit density in, in rural areas. But so that we just allow a, an exception for small lots. And, and our definition of small would also be relatively arbitrary if we're just saying 15. Yeah, I mean, say is, to allow I, somebody to split a lot into two. Right. I mean, we could say it could be, you know, 15 or 20. Well, that's just it. it. I, like, I, it I depends don't know on how many lots we want right. somebody to divide it. If, if everybody, you know, agrees that this is something we should make an exception for. Yeah, I, I completely agree with the, the avoiding, if you take all the rural area and just cut it up into five acre spots and put a house on it, that's not cool. That, that's not what we're looking for. Um, so there needs to be some control. I guess now it's just where do we put that lever? I, I don't I don't have a problem with just saying 15, but then, you know, do we have somebody that comes in and says, oh, I've got a 16 acre lot that this needs to happen. I just, I mean, where... I'm just trying to get this stuff out there to make sure that we're... All 15 does is guarantee somebody that has 10 acres the ability to build, pretty right. much. And if somebody has 15 good acres, then they can put three on it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good point. If somebody has 30 I mean, acres and they just want to split it into two, then why don't we allow that? And we probably should. So maybe well, it's... If they have 30 be. acres, all they need is 10 acres of developable. I mean, that some of this is just the, you know, what's the distribution of undevelopable land on lots. But by the time you get north of... 25 acres, your chances of having at least 10 acres of developable land get pretty good. So if someone's got 30 acres and all they want to do is split it into two, they probably are not, and we'll, we could do some digging, um, there probably are not a lot of lots that are in that situation. What you'd be more likely to be facing is a situation where someone has a 30 acre lot, but instead of having six, because of developable land area, they have only four or five, and they say, but I want six. And then you'd be, you know, is, is four out of six enough? I mean, is that a reasonable or a fair? So we could say, I mean, if this doesn't cover that, then we could say um, something like um, that, except for um, for a development of splitting one lot into two or something like that. I think the way you've written it is, is fine. Yeah, I, I don't have an objection to that. I just, I mostly just wanted to talk it through a little bit. To I would encourage, I mean, the idea of having uh, that little qualification in the definitions, it, it kind of undoes the definition uh, I mean, maybe I'd want, it'd be great to hear again what specific words you are proposing. You know, we would retain A, if, if what I'm hearing is correct, yeah. A would remain, but there would be something added to the end of the last sentence. Of, of A. So, oh, um, okay. it, so would, it, would be it would be keeping of... A okay. and saying slopes of 15% or more, and then add a comma. Okay. And say, uh, lots of except for lots of less than 15 acres. Or you could say slopes of 15% or more on lots of 15 acres or more. Sure. Yeah, yeah that's probably more clear. So the suggestion is A would... This is only apropos slopes. Right. That's only apropos slopes. That's just for density. 
It's, it's, well, it's, it's plus the wetlands and the floodplain still. Yeah, it's just keeping that in just. It's what's there so already. If you have slopes, you're good. You can but still But if you have wetlands build. or floodplain, then you're. You right. can't build. You can't build floodplain. Yeah. Even if you have plenty of building envelope, that land is not honored as buildable. Which land? Flood your plain. wetland or your floodplain. Right. Right. That seems unfair. But so the other thing I was going to mention. <laughs> to not be able to build on a wetland? Well, no. No one's going to be building on any of those things. Probably even the slope. They're going to find the most buildable envelope on the, on the parcel. The whole reason they came up with 15% for developable land is because wetlands were already considered non-developable. Right, but land. I don't understand why under the PUD it also indicates steep slopes are sensitive. That doesn't sound like density. That sounds environmental. Well, they are sensitive, but I don't know why that's there either. And that's, this is where it's, it's the difference between having something that says they're sensitive and they should be avoided and having something that says if the slope is greater than 15%, you cannot build on it. And that's why I keep going back to this idea of where if the DRB restricts or conditions an approval and says, no, you cannot build on slopes greater than 15%, then if they approve you, you have approval. They would be basically interpreting that language about slopes being sensitive as saying, well, 15%, eh. You know, if they were talking about 25, I would be shocked if they were to say, okay, build on those. But 15 is, as slopes go, is kind of a middling slope. The other thing I was just going to point out, as far as uh, amending the definition, as Stephen is saying, as compared to the approach that was being considered before, we're taking this beyond the rural district. So this is saying, regardless of the district, because the developable land definition applies everywhere. The conversation, as I had been understanding it, was really concerned about creating this notch in the rural district. And if you do it here in the definition, as opposed to another place where it was being thought of before, it means everywhere. It may not be a bad thing, but I'm just pointing that out. So if we took this, took slopes out of here, wouldn't that be everywhere too? If you took slope, it, it is, it does. That is the implication. That, I mean, the taking it out of the definition means it's taken out everywhere. Uh, I, that was not what I. Uh, this is the definition of yeah. developable land. And I, I would mean, have a conflict there because I'd love to see it disappear on my lot, but I. That's not what I anticipated. Trying to do it just in the wetland, in the rural district. Right. And this this is this definition applies everywhere. So any P, it applies to any lot in the rural district, and it applies to any PUD in other districts. It's a little bit different in the other districts, but so it seems like we should. Well, the other districts that, that definition. In there as a definition, the, the place I would and, suggest that you think and about pinpoint where we want to exempt it if we want to exempt you, it you in the it actual section. Mm. The, um, the, the place where you would do it is in the density section. This is 330, section or Article 3 is the rural district, and the rural district zoning has these density requirements and these minimum lot size requirements. And what you would perhaps want to do is change 330.1a where you would you would do your quali your qualifier um, under that because that's what we're talking about we're talking about right. density on a single family lot in the rural district 330 is rural district so you'd say single family dwelling the density is one single family dwelling for five acres of developable land except on lots of 15 acres or less where it's five acres of land. That's that's essentially what you're trying to do. Okay. Because that's narrowly drawing the, the change. So that, that path would have us keeping in the slopes of 15% as part of the developable land discussion. Right. And it would then, mean just that developable land in the rural district doesn't apply if your lot's 15 acres or less. 
but we would still be keeping the language on making all rural district developments Pe PUDs. Well, that's the conversation I mean, the, that you guys the discussion right. that yes, we're having. Right. would want to be having is right. Is that is, is the idea that you're heading towards a hearing on a proposal that would instead of modifying the definition, modify the density and this other stuff, whatever other stuff that's a consensus. For. So on this uh, second thing. With the shift to PUD, how would that interfere with our idea of hamlets and cultural innovation in the rural areas? Like, it actually, would benefit them. Mm -hmm. by would, I mean, that's what I just wanted to kind of like discuss the implications. You think? Well, my, that would you know, be my thought about hamlets in the rural area is that we're not going to get any large hamlets because the soils are so poor out there. We might get clusters of three and four, and maybe five or six lots. But I don't think that we'll ever really come up with a large hamlet because of the soils, unless some other engineering change comes up that makes it possible. Hmm. And I like the idea of hamlets, but I just realistically I don't think they're going to work. But I, I I think we should keep it, and if there is a place where it works. Well, perfect. so for this, do we go for a third iteration, which is? keep the slopes of 15% in that definition and change the rural district single family home definition and then keep the PUD language? I like the PUD language. I, I That's kind of what I wanted to do to start with. I felt like we could do a lot more, but, you know, Dean kind of encouraged me to keep it basic and try to not yeah, make this I think a major th thing. This is stuff that we'll end up expanding on, I think, once we get the new plan in place anyway. So um, I kind of tried to keep it as basic as I could, but I thought a couple of those little changes would benefit them. You know, the open space, uh, creating that open space, which is what the town plan is calling for. And then what Steve, your change tonight, I think really does help too with the rural district. So does this set us on a path where at the next meeting, if we add in We'll make make those changes and add it that then we would have something that we could collectively approve. Like, are we all? It does for me. Uh, I, I, does the I, audience I'm a, have anything to say? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just concerned about the steep slopes and deforestation on those that might have that kind of resource on it, and how does. How do the two of them um, intersect when you're making a decision? If you, you're giving permission on the steep slopes and somebody mm -hmm. decides to take out all the trees, mm -hmm. and that affects the runoff. Well, and there are other provisions around that, aren't there, in general? Preventing cutting of trees. <laughs> Not I don't know if this them, is the section that that, belo that belongs in or if that belongs in a different section. <laughs> Yeah. I think only if you're you're only um, regulated if you're within a certain distance of the lake, like mm. 250 feet of the of the lake shore. What, what about rivers and streams? Well, that's for the yeah. buffers. I'm, I'm you're actually supposed to. Yeah. For those, we haven't determined how much they're supposed to do, but. But I don't think it. I don't think there's any restriction on clear cutting a. 15% slope if you're in a in the woods somewhere. So I don't know if that would be another thing that we should be talking about too, I guess, at some point. Yeah, I, I suppose I'm mostly <laughs> thinking of this issue and how it's iterated. Um, and I, I, a firm believer, I don't think we should rough, rush a process if we're not ready for it, which we're, we're clearly not. But I feel like we've been at a spot where we were ready to proceed and then haven't been able to. So I, I'm just trying to get what what is our consensus in terms of something that we could actually vote and agree upon that could be put together for the next time. And what I'm seeing right now, I mean, we, I feel like we could always, we could consistently uncover new things. So my, my question about the trees, and that was probably stemming from when I went out to Quinney for the Act 250 walkthrough, and there was a lot of concern about what trees were going to get cut down. And I was sort of extrapolating that to, is is that the sort of thing in the DRB when they're reviewing PODs and that sort of thing, if they say, hey, I see here that you're about to clear cut two acres of forest, we don't, we would like it if you not do that. 
Um, if there's those types of mechanisms to have that kind of pushback, then this wouldn't concern me at all, and I wouldn't see that as a huge issue. Almost the only way to prevent that, though, is to have it in the reg, because if it's not in the reg, then somebody could buy a piece of land, go ahead and cut their two acres, and then go after that. But all, all we're talking about right now is trees that are on a slope right. that would be built on. Right. And, I mean, for there could be really good reasons why that would be the place you need to build on as a trade-off to some other place on the property. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I'm just worried that we're starting to go down rabbit holes, and there's right. always going to be a situation that we're not going to be happy with. Um, I, I think going back to what Stephen was saying earlier makes a lot of sense. That what you know, look at the big picture of what we're trying to sort of shape happen, right? Which is we don't want to um, enable somebody to come in and take a really large parcel and that has a lot of um, resource issues, right? In the rural area we're talking about. And I think we need to be specific about it's the rural area because I actually am concerned about limiting what we can do in the places where we want to have growth mm -hmm. um, because, you know, we have to, we, the growth is coming, right? I mean, we just have to accept that we are, you know, it's coming, right? Quinniasca should, you know, have, have uh, made that very clear to us. So we, the, all that we can do is shape how it happens. And I think that, um, you know, there have to be some sacrificial lambs in some of this and we have growth areas and it makes, this is an, a huge opportunity to shape where the growth goes and how it goes on a smaller footprint, a smaller, more compact footprint, because we also have these very delicate riparian buffers through there. Unfortunately, that's the the, the way it's configured. So, um, but I think that that allowing small properties like the Meniers in the rural area, those are already developed lands. To go ahead and focus the development there makes some sense, and keep as much of the large, um, undeveloped tracks. Um, open as possible. That's where the, the resource value is, right? And, and, and the scenic value is. If we can keep those as undeveloped as, as possible, that makes a lot of sense. So I would be in favor of um, keeping the restrictions on that uh, tight and figuring out ways to tighten them and, um, and enabling um, already developed parcels to, um, that are small to you know, be made more efficient use of. Um, and maybe those can eventually, uh, you know, morph into something that we're starting to refer to as hamlets, mm. even though we don't really know what we mean by that yet. So that's what I think. So, Kate, what I'm hearing is like these changes should not apply to parcels that are larger than 15 acres in the rural areas. The PUD would still come into play if we're if we're pushing. Are we still considering the PUD? Is I guess I thought we were. But. For the rural district, yeah, yeah, I thought that so. We're was still doing a fifteen. We're still doing the rural district PUD, and we're doing what Steve suggested. Right. So the That's only where we're at right the now. only question was because the slopes of fifteen percent or more on lots of fifteen acres or more that that would also that would apply to all zoning districts based on where right right and we changed that by doing the density right. So is that pretty yeah. clear? What we're, is that everything that. We, well, I think Kate, Kate's adding um, the point that we're looking at the small lots. It's a previously developed lot. Now, it, that means it's got a house on it. So it's maybe we got to put that wording in for I mean, previously developed lots of less than 15 acres. Yeah, I mean, these are not pristine conditions, you yeah. know. So um, if, if our goal is to preserve resources, I think we have to be you know, it doesn't make sense to put a whole lot of energy into preserving places that are already developed because it's not as valuable as the places that are not developed yet. Um, and, and we still are fortunate to have, you know, a fair amount of those. So that would, if we said that, added that previously developed lots in there, it would keep somebody from making a bunch of 15 acre lots and then splitting them further later on in half or making into two or something like that. I'm just trying to think of what's the worst case of, well, of anything that case could come about this. Maybe unless, I mean, depending on how you phrase previously developed, developed as of the date that the new regs take effect because the gaming of the system would yeah. be you build the house first and then you come in and you get the split because it's previously developed. Right. So, so again, yeah, unless the you say any lot 
that was developed with a single family house on it as of a certain date, then you get to be treated on that. So how about previously developed as the date of passing of this? Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm saying is, is that, like that. You, you'd have to qualify what the previously developed yeah. is. Um, so that's a, I mean, that's a new concept no, we have to as far as this discussion goes, and that's, that's where the consensus is. Because they would be further restricting the lot has to have, have single family house on it. That's the threshold. So would that all be jumbled into 21.10.36.A? I mean, the slopes of 15% or more on lots of 15 acres or more and less. Yeah, I mean, it may be, maybe we would figure out how to structure it so that it's most clear. Uh, <laughs> maybe the, you know, but I believe that's the case for it, as yeah. opposed to the definition. But I think the critical thing is, given that this is the third time mm -hmm. that we've come really close, yeah. is that is it really what the consensus is for? <laughs> Yeah, my concern would be that we put some language in place and then we're sitting here at the next meeting and having the same conversation because there's a consideration that we missed. Or mm -hmm. yeah. Can you show 340 as we've got it proposed? 340? Yeah, as it's proposed right now. I wondered if if we eliminated the red when the DRB determines the project complies in accordance with the provisions all the way to regulations, it seems like it says the same thing twice. So I almost think if we got rid of that all the way to reg from where the red starts to regulations, that it's already covered again in the next sentence. So what would it word? Uh, how would it how would it be worded? It would just say planned unit development residential will be permitted in the rural district. Period. Um, and then any subdivision proposed to create one or more lots for residential or related development purposes, including reserving for future development, must be reviewed as a planned unit development. Residential in accordance with the provisions of section, there we go again, 1930.3 of these regulations. Seems like we're saying it twice. Well, maybe instead of the will up at the very beginning, maybe you have to say may because. It should be may because we want, we well, want to PUDs. But you're saying it will be permitted. Some, Nobody a even has to unit, apply. They, a, a it'll be permitted. Unit, a planned unit development will be permitted in the rural district. The reason it says will is because it's conditioned on the when the DRB determines that yeah. the project complies. Yeah. Right. And then when it was May, it was just May. So maybe you go back to May and say residential, a PUD residential may be permitted in the rural district, period. And subdivision proposing. Maybe that's how that's how we shorten it. Just go back to May, and then you don't have the re repetition with the when the DRB determines because it's already picked up in the last sentence. Or maybe we just wipe out that first sentence entirely and say uh, any subdivision, any residential subdivision proposing to create blah blah blah. We just have that second <coughs> sentence mm -hmm. because that's what's saying it must be reviewed as a planned unit development, and that's what you want to right. do with this thing. Yes, yeah, so that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Okay. Right. Is there any need to refer to anything in nineteen thirty point three? We're just saying that it would be. Oh, no, it is already. Yeah, so just getting rid of the first sentence. Yeah, it should because of what's in the mm -hmm. wetlands. <laughs> 
So having that, and then we just need to tighten up language on the uh, 2110.36a with the slopes 14, 15 acres or more <coughs> previously developed. Is that? Yeah, that's, that, that's going to be something that we go back to because it wasn't active. What, sorry, which one is this? Uh, it would be on the first page. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's going to be some editing of... Yeah, and I, just to make clear, there's, I realize that by cutting and pasting in your memo, which what had been point two, the numbering changed automatically to one, so um, we are talking about 30.2 and 30.1, and it would be in 30.1 where it may just be that you add a D or something to make it clear rather than making Sense. Well, yeah. Why, um, where do we see the, the lot size? It's 330.1 on yeah, but it's page really 5. Should be, in your memo, that should be 330.2, because 330.2, and what I have on the screen right now is the real zoning. So that's where, it, that's the auto numbering in the Word document slipped, because there was nothing in front of it, so the 2 reverted to a 1. So there's the thing about the rural district is it separates lot size from density, and so that's why they're both there. And okay, the so there's still a dimensional requirement of of five acres. Well, the I mean I, this is a good question. If everything is a PUD, there won't be any more conventional five acre lots, or at least it's unlikely. So that's why in your memo, you have a rewrite of what is mislabeled as 330.1, it's really 330.2, that would change what you see on the screen right now from five acres to as required by the PUD review. That's basically making it clear that, you know, for some people, they're gonna, they're gonna say, oh, the lot's in the rural district, what's the minimum lot size? Yeah. They're going to see five acres. Well, no, that's not true because we won't know the minimum lot size until it gets through the PUD process. Mm -hmm. There's no, no more default lot size. So what had been prepared before tonight's meeting was this idea that 330.2 would be amended. It wouldn't say five acres anymore. It would be as required by review under Section 1930.3 because that's where the lot sizes will be determined. But then what guidelines are there in there to determine a lot size? Well, that's going to be, it's going to be the result of the open space requirement. So that's going to help by pulling out some of the land. It's going to be as a result of the building envelope. So it's, it's not going to be fixed. So maybe sometimes it would be sensible for the lot size to be larger. Well, usually with zoning, you don't have a problem with it being larger. And sometimes it will be smaller. But it won't be a fixed number. Okay, so yeah. the this 15 acre thing that that I was proposing it doesn't really apply because um, there's there's no limit to how many houses could go on that so the any density, size lot then but the density is going to still be based on the land area so the the density will be that it's not a it's not a way of creating okay. a density bonus yeah. it'll still be based on five acres of, of land, Great. as long as okay. you have the lot that's less than 15 and with a house on it. I see. Jason, you have a question? Yes. Yeah. I, 
think you answered the question, but can't help it. Here's the guy. On average, whatever wherever the PUD is, there will be some varied density. Some will be larger, maybe some will be smaller than five acres. But on average, for that entire parcel, the density shall not be greater than five. Am I correct? Of developable land, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you're not removing that overall. No minimum requirement. density for a residential lot will still be five acres. Although within a, within a PUD, acres, that's you have a big acre here and you cluster here. The individual houses may be less than five acres. This whole thing is still still going to add out to five acres. Not really. greater than five acres. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are we closer? <laughs> it sounds good to me. I think <laughs> that's making making sense to me. I can't guarantee I'm not missing something, but um, I like it so far. We All get right. another pass at it next time. Yeah. Yeah. In case. All right. I would like to beg off. I'm missing a really great party. <laughs> Same an thing. office party. Yeah. I know. It was an office party. And I <laughs> told them I'll be back by Well, then so let's stop asking them. questions. What are you missing? My wife so is will. missing. My so I'm all can, for everything all that we've done. And kids wouldn't buy. <laughs> all right. Oh. So, they're like well, so now we have the uh, oh, gosh. planning <laughs> grant <laughs> options. But <laughs> actually, this meeting's going to end if you bail as well. Well, no, it's yeah. before. We need to, we oh, need that's to, true. It would. We need to wrap it up, though. Oh, we I definitely do. Got something really fun. Oh, no, we get certainly back do. To. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. If you need to, go for it. Um, so we have planning grant options, and then approval of the minutes, and then yeah. announcements. So the uh, planning grant option. So uh, there was a maybe I'll come in. I prepared a memo that was. Uh, uh, following up what I thought was the direction the last time to just say there are a couple different directions that a planning grant application might go in. One would be kind of cut and dry, which would be along the lines of doing what Gail was saying. You know, when you have the new plan, when will you work on zoning? Well, if we got this planning grant, and if the planning grant was for implementation of things in the zoning reg and in the town plan, um, that's a that's a mechanism for doing it. That was the kind of cut and dried option. The less cut and dried option was some kind of Hamlet study, and I had um, done some research previously and did some additional work, and came across a Hamlet study that had been done in the town of Waitsfield back in 2005, I believe it was, um, and thought it was perhaps an interesting um, model, but. It was, you know, it's just one approach. Um, this is a topic that Kate, Hamlet's is a topic <coughs> that Kate has had a lot of interest in and uh, invested a lot in. So you have, you emailed something that I didn't copy to this computer, but I can send to myself so I can show yeah. it. Yeah, well, you know, I, another way to think about this is, um, pursuing a grant that could work on developing some PUD types that would be appropriate for the rural areas in Shelburne. That, that so are you, are, are you saying that partly because of the South Burlington PUD study? Because they're coming up with a PUD typology. So oh, no, is that I, just I, a crazy I, coincidence? I did, it's a crazy coincidence. I didn't even know they were doing that. Okay. But I'm kind of thinking that that might make more sense. Um, I mean, it just, it, it, you know, I, I noticed that the housing committee, which had been very gung-ho at one point on Hamlet's, now is recommending, you know, that, that, that not even be in the language of the comprehensive plan. So um, I, I don't know what to totally make of that, but um, PUD types might, you know, just, that might make more sense um, than than doing, I just, I'm not sure what we would gain by a Hamlet study, frankly. I mean, there's some really interesting ways to go about it, but, um, but again, it would be a um, kind of a top-down approach. Uh, people might feel that, you know, we're telling them what they should do with their land, and, and I, I, I think the goal, 
as I understand it, is to try and shape and focus development and growth. And um, I think providing people with a bunch of options um, that are, you know, when we're dictating the form, I'm, I'm thinking about coming up with some form-based um, versions. So this is, South Burlington is working on a uh, PU, PUD study, multi-phase PUD study. And, and when I was talking with people about the idea of Hamlets, this was something that um, also came up. Uh, and they are creating a typology of PUDs. And anyway, um, it's just kind of an interesting coincidence that you brought it up. I, I'm looking for a consensus on um, the topic so that we can start to develop the grant. If the Planning Commission, with limited information, wants to go in the direction of the PUD study, I can email out this material from South Burlington. I'm just looking for some idea of what we would need to start writing the grant about. Um, so it's got to be about a specific PUD? Uh, the city of South Burlington has been um, working with different consultants or with a team of consultants on um, this, what was described to me as a PUD typology. So different parts of South Burlington would have a different menu or menus of PUDs that would um, be allowed in those areas. It's transect yeah. based. Uh, yeah, I don't know if their PUD concept is transect based or not. Maybe I'd be surprised if it weren't. Um, so, uh, it, it was, it came to my attention and it seemed like, oh, this is somewhat, you know, intriguing, but it's not, it's not a Hamlet study or it's not about Hamlets per se, so I, I pulled away from it, but they have a conservation PUD, a planned ag development PUD, so it doesn't seem to be, it's a typology, it's, um, and some would be appropriate in the rural areas, and some definitely not, because they're doing this town town wide. There's a TND PUD if we didn't have enough letters already, a neighborhood center, a TOD, infill PUD. Um, so the the way that grants work would the fact that South Burlington is working on a grant like this, and we're right next door and is that a detriment uh no i don't think so i mean a lot of we have a very different context mm -hmm. yeah i mean a lot of communities were doing for me zoning mm -hmm. well, we actually help and i was thinking we could do ours with an idea towards how do we maximize our conservation goals for the rural area Right, I mean, we have we have this kind of model of of growth that we're developing in the town plan, which is you know most dense in the village, and then um, slightly less dense, but but still walkable and compact and relatively dense in the areas surrounding the village, and then we want essentially there to be kind of an abrupt change, and then you have rural areas which are much more rural. Um, and if it, it, so, how how I, I'm thinking of a PUD typology study that would um, uh, support that goal, but it would be specific for the rural areas because I think that's the area that is the most in in danger right now. Um, you know, I mean, right now, frankly, a lot of developers are. You know they're kind of doing the walkable connected thing, right? Because that's what sells. So they're you know they're s motivated to do that. But but we want to make sure that we we don't get. I mean uh, some of the stuff up there looks very sprawly to me. That sort of thing showing up in our rural area, right? Where well, we I, have five acre zoning, which is a big concern. Yeah. Um, like I said, I I'm very happy to send this out yeah. so people can look at it and see, but um, it, if that would help facilitate the whole PUD discussion and where we might go once the plan is in place and we start tackling these topics in more detail. Yeah, it could. It could, could have that function. 
I mean, so, other things that were brought up tonight would be, and I know we talked about it as a potential grant at some point, was a mechanism for how to pull residents easier. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how realistic that would be in terms of the grant funders. Yeah, I don't know if something that might be hardware-based would be as appealing. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I haven't sub not submitted a grant for hardware or equipment under that program before. Doesn't mean they couldn't. Well, I suppose I'd be interested in, I guess, reviewing this because if we're planning on getting into zoning discussions once the new plan's in place, then this would all be good to, for all of us to be aware of, but then also if it makes sense to pursue a grant to help tighten things up. Yeah. We're getting to the point where we really, I'm, I'm not expecting that you would, as a body, say, okay, this is what it will be, but I think we would need to know by the next meeting because it's really getting close because the mm -hmm. idea will have to be developed enough to make the application to get a consultant to give us some idea. I think it helps if we are doing something like this because we can talk to the people that did it. Um, but then we also have to get the idea to the select board so that they can endorse the application. Um, I think uh, the PUD, just for the rural areas, as Kate said, I think that's probably casts a broader net than just the Hamlet concept because th this way you can have broader design options. But I commented on, uh, sent you back my response from the email, but I think in the last public hearing there were kind of concerns raised about cultural uh, revitalization and kind of like innovation hubs in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. So I think like some of those issues can be integrated in this kind of like PUD study mm -hmm. where yeah, you, could have a you can kind of like, PUD. right, so kind mm -hmm. of like how you want to kind of like steer uh, development that is in, in the rural areas that's not like suburban-like but rather kind of conserves the historical resources, cultural resources, natural resources, but at the same time provide some kind of like a community public space. Uh, so I think that's, we can probably go in that direction. That's what I would suggest. Um, that would help with Shelburne's future in terms of like rural areas, the one that's really vulnerable to suburban growth compared to the, where we have identified already like developed areas or growth areas. So. So it sounds like people are saying that this is a, a good contender. It's going to be worth investing the time to start to put together the framework of the application and make the contacts with the people to get some idea of what the cost would be because there's some support for it. I just don't want to go in a direction where you know you might, if it's a coin toss, that you might do something else. But if it seems likely, then... We'll invest the time and start to put it together. I mean, are there any other ideas that would take precedent over this? I mean, I, I wonder about transportation and traffic issues. Those are clearly a huge concern for mm. many people in our Yeah, in and, our and the, the, the positive. I mean, I know there have been many little studies here and there for different elements, but I don't know if there's been an overall. There hasn't been. And, and actually, I wanted to speak to that for a minute because um, I was looking, um, and the town of Jericho did a, uh, on their website, they did an amazing um, bike ped study in 2015, which is uh, very comprehensive. And it was like visioning, it was great. And they came up with very specific recommendations for uh, that's that are very place-based. So it's like literally this segment of the road, this type of facility, this segment you know, the road becomes different and, you know, this becomes more appropriate. And, um, and then they also have model bylaws for bike and pedestrian, um, uh, you know, regulations um, it, it, that, you know, to go into ordinances. So um, I uh, attended a, the, the recent DRB meeting um, to talk to them about some of our goals for bicycles and pedestrians. And, um, you know, they, they kind of, you know, get it in the, in the context of the village, but beyond the village in the growth area, there's a pretty limited understanding of what our, our objectives are. This is the document you're referring to. Or yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it seemed to me that, you know, this kind of thing would be really a great way to sort of 
get everybody on the same page in the town about what it is that we want to um, achieve with multimodality, what that means, what that means in various places, and what are our priorities. Um, These kinds of studies have a good chance of being funded through the Regional Planning Commission and the MPO process. Um, so just generally speaking, transportation studies go that route for funding. Right. And so, so it's a good idea, and it would be the sort of thing that would be pitched in a more like an um, April or May time frame. Okay. We should definitely pursue that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree, yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, this, yeah, this is, I agree, this is a great way to go whenever the time is right. I also um, think that the, P, the PUD study might shed a bunch of insight on what we're talking about specific, specifically. This right here, this chart looks kind of general. I would hope that they'd be more specific in their... Yeah. Well, this was the at a glance. <laughs> so so they're, I think they're trying to make it, to distill it. Um, and as I was saying, there, there are multiple phases to this project. Uh, this was the part that was done two years ago. And I know that you can go on their website and there are technical memos f for pretty recent times more detailed things that they're developing. Um, I was glad that I had to put this on the computer. So the, this one, it sounds like for the grant submission that needs to go in Yeah, this is, this is a topic I think that lines up well April. with the, the deadline that we're looking at. The transportation work would, I think, I mean, you could apply. Um, I think sometimes their judgments about transportation projects or transportation grant applications is that should you know they should be they should try to get the MPO money for it and use this money for something else. But you know I think I think um, ACCD might see that this would complement what South Burlington is doing, particularly if we focused on you know our rural areas because we do. I, I agree. We do abut them, you know. So um, I could see they were thinking that might be um, you know worthwhile investment. Yeah, I don't. I I think that it. There's no harm that this is being done by South Burlington. Yeah. I think it would be helpful. So it sounds like that's what we're backing. Yeah. Well, like I say, at least enough to. I mean, I feel comfortable enough to know this is the direction to spend some time in, so that when I come to you in your next meeting and I can show you, here's how far things have gotten. Does this look okay? Because by that point, it may be just too late to change. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that okay. sounds good to me. Okay. So Asim has a bonfire that's going on at his house right now. Please, yeah. So he needs to go. Please go enjoy. <laughs> uh, so, all right, home stretch. Uh, approval <laughs> of the minutes. Um, so we'll take a motion to. Yeah, they look great. For approve the minutes. Do you, do you want to make the motion? Uh, yeah, so moved. We have a second. I was absent. So. Oh, I was absent. right. That's true. It's all you I and can, me. Can I? I? We may actually have to because so, Stephen wasn't here either. That's true. Yeah. So the, right. talk, the talk I gave to another committee is that there's no statutory requirement to approve minutes. It's a it's a practice. It's, so there's nothing that would prevent someone from voting on minutes that they, for a meeting they didn't attend, especially, you know, if you're one of seven and you want to, say, yes, you can go ahead. But this is the first time that you haven't been able to do it. I've seen other groups that have gone for like six meetings because the right people weren't there. Oh. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I think if you wanted to just defer. Well, how about if, if it looks okay to the people who were there? Are they, is it okay if those guys vote? I mean, if they want to? Like I say, there's no statutory requirement yeah. that it's be approved. Well, if there's if there's any issues with it, we can open it up and amend the record, right? Can uh, we? Generally speaking, you approve your minutes, you amend them and approve them. Um, or if there's a question, just if it's easier defer. to defer, I'm happy to defer. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so we'll defer the minute <laughs> approval to next time. We just didn't need to let us see him go. Oh, well, he wasn't. He wasn't. I, I, I think he was there, yeah. Okay. I think so. He was there. I think I saw yeah. the video. Um, okay, so then we'll defer that to next time. Um, under other business, 
Uh, there was definitely the White and Burt thing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Yeah, so we, we got, they picked us. Oh, yeah, that's um, really cool. And the, uh, so White and Burt have this, they do this massive development conference thing every um, November. And so we got picked as their municipal example. And just to refresh everybody's memory, what will happen is um, they're going to just sort of, they've got a team of experts who's going to spend a certain amount of time. I'm still learning all the details of exactly what it is we've gotten ourselves involved with, but it's pretty, it's, it's pretty big time. I hadn't realized that. Very high profile. And um, so it'll give lots of good coverage for us. And they're going to sort of review our, you know, our corridor, the physical characteristics of our corridor. Um, and this is just happening in Burlington. So everybody knows, you know, everybody's familiar with it who participates in this. And, um, and our form-based code and just sort of evaluate, like, how effective is this thing as a marketing tool for the potential of the Route 7 corridor? Mm -hmm. And, you know, because there have been changes with, you know, the regional markets, retail, you know, this is, this is shifting ground here, right? So um, it is, even though it was only approved in 2016, how current is it? And then the other big thing is, to what degree is it a detriment that this, the darn thing is only an optional zoning code when the whole point of, of form-based code is you're selling predictability? Well, you can't actually guarantee predictability if, you know, there, there's an option to use the same bad old stuff, right? So, you know, what, just what are, what are their insights? And, and then if it, there need to be tweaks and, and things, what would those be? And, and um, you know, what, what could, can we do? And, and they're going to be experts from um, all sorts of different uh, fields attending. So we'll have a lot of different perspectives. And I am actually very hoping uh, that we get some perspective on the stormwater mm -hmm. issue. And if there's some kind of creative ways that are emerging for dealing with that, because that, of course, is, you know, becoming a bigger problem. So do you know if it's if it's the morning session where there would be an hour and 15 minutes, or is it one of the shorter power sessions? I think we're, I don't know. I just don't know how this works yet. Um, I think we are, I guess we're part of, um, I don't know. I, okay. Yeah, one of the afternoon sections, I think. Um, and there should be, based on her yeah. notice, sounded like there'd be more information coming. There, was, there like, is, yeah, yeah. Does this yeah. say what day it's on? Um, it's I know it's in it's, November. Yeah, it's the day after the state housing yeah. conference, which oh, was right. two days yeah. before. Yeah, so it's like it's the a 14, Tuesday, Wednesday, 15, Thursday. It's going to be kind of a trick to yeah. figure right. it all out. November fifteenth. Yeah. Well, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I nice. kind of accidentally got us into something that was even more fabulous. high profile mm -hmm. than I knew, um, and it you know, anyway. Uh, yeah, it's excellent. So. Any other announcements or other business? I'm, I'm fried. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just ask a quick question Absolutely. regarding Maya? I don't have additional sources of photographs, and so the photo needed is kind of haunting me in the plan. There's a lot of places for photos are still needed. Um, could we ask her to tap into her design sources? If she's willing to do that, for sure. I mean, I so you can also put out another call. Um, On Front Porch Forum? But I, that, saying, I may like, have diminishing pictures? returns if it hasn't yielded. I mean, I, I've, I don't know. I've. Are there areas where, you're, where we're lacking things in particular? We, yes. I mean, we're still, I sent along what you had shared with me yesterday. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I don't honestly know. You know what's on her computer right now, what sh she's integrated. I mean, we, I, I've sent her quite a bit. Yeah. Some things she's choosing not to include, which is her design decision. Mm. Um, so I, um, I can't say you've got to put that rooster picture in there that I sent you from the girl who lives across the street from me. <laughs> but I, so I've sent her more than what's in there. Yeah. Um, again, maybe it's a quality issue, a resolution issue. She doesn't see it as apropos. I mean, but there's still a lot of blanks, and so even I can do another shout out, another call, but I fear that. I mean, I did that quite a bit, and I did it with my personal circles as well. 
Um, well, if she's got, if she has contacts, but I, I guess. But there's know. also just Shutterstock. I mean, there are, there's stock photography. Yeah, but I guess that's the thing. Is, some of is, which is free. And is is she? What's what's her take on a stock photo that's not Shelburne that may be technically great versus something that's a little bit of a compromise, but it's Shelburne. Right. I mean, and is that? I mean, she's got her her aesthetic. Maybe people would think something is fine that she's a little unsure of. Well, and, and are we to a point? I I, yeah. I did look at that the spreadsheet with all the picture references, but I think it was to sections and type of photo. But is there something where we could have a list saying need a picture of a rooster or a fire mm -hmm. truck or that sort of thing that could be posted that might generate? I mean, I guess I could check in with her and ask to see the most updated version and see where we stand. Mm -hmm. Um, and try to make a call. But I, I think even with additional solicitations of our community members, we'll still come up short. Yeah. All right. And, I, you know, and there's, she also has a lot of little pictures, some of which, if it were me designing it, I would maybe take that obvious Shelburne Farms picture and you make that a big one. And then, hmm. uh, so, you know, so s she's using up a lot of photos in small ways instead of necessarily in a bigger shot. Mm -hmm. So I'm, not horrendously concerned, but I, it's just an issue. And as time marches along, yeah, we want it to look nice when it goes to the select board. Mm -hmm. So she has enough photos. You've, you've well, it sounds I, like you've done a lot of work to get. These I mean, she photos. she's has she has. And I've sent her more than what she's put in. But, but I would say she. I agree. She should use the ones that may not be. You know quite what she's looking for, but aren't stock photos. Because everybody can always tell a stock photo, and then it starts to look so generic. It doesn't right. look like Shelburne. It's just. Right. Well, I'd say if she's, if she's still wrapping up some stuff, maybe we just make a request to say, hey, when it comes to the pictures, if we just do a quick, hey, what's our inventory? Where are the blanks right. that we need? Right. And then if we can put a targeted description of what it is we're looking for, I mean, we could do one There's also request. a million sunsets over farms and not so many energy pictures. I mean, it's just hard to uh, get. Right. I mean. If you looked on your phone right now, what photos you've taken? I sent in a picture of right. um, the array at Shelburne Farms. Nice. Well, that was very helpful, and that's in the plan. Now. Oh, is it? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> the only, <laughs> only picture of a solar farm ever. And, and I reached out to the Shelburne Farms specifically and to Meech Cove to try yeah. to get yeah. some of those I mean, images. Are, well, you probably, probably take a beautiful one this fall when the uh, leaves are turning from the parking lot of the museum of the Meech Cove array or as you're right, coming down true. coming down boswick i guess you, you start to see it well and I... mostly being really mindful of time because i know it's getting yeah. late but yeah if I, i'm wondering if we could just ask her for just an inventory i'll just, just check to know yeah and, areas yeah. where she's because I, I do think when it comes to just novice photographers in the community certain topics just aren't people just don't photograph those mm -hmm. yeah. so i mean if there's a critical list of three or five things that she says it's you don't appreciate it now but you'll thank me later and you need these photos of these things send someone out right. yeah we'll, we'll ask and we can and we i can feel like lee out. may have a vast gallery that we may have more i mean i think don't. he's given her access to a lot but maybe if she says these three to five things and he looks mm -hmm. at it with that in mind mm -hmm. right yeah, I mean, it may also be helpful to know, does she have any image libraries that she would say, well, okay, if you're going to go into the well, go here. I mean, I know that the Northern New England chapter of the American Planning Association, there's an image library that they have. So that's New England photos. They won't be, they won't be like stock photos, but they'll be, you know, if there's a picture of a roundabout, it'll at least be a New England roundabout. Or maybe yeah. a Vermont roundabout. Well, we'll just ask her what's missing, and then okay. we can take it from I there. just think there's a lot. Yeah. And feel free to loop me in, too. I can okay. do some digging. Um, I, d I just had a quick comment that last night there was a um, – it's called the Clean Water Cafe. It's a series that's put on, I think, uh, by the Blue Program. And um, so Juliana Dix Dixon was there from that, and Rebecca Weber from the Conservation Law Foundation just to talk about water. Uh, it was done at the vineyard. Chris Robinson was there. Lee was there. A um, couple of residents. And it was just a general discussion about exposure around water treatment, stormwater, wastewater, all of that stuff and distinguishing. And I would encourage people to, to attend those types of discussions because I certainly learned a lot. And I 
to sit in on these meetings. So um, anyway, that was it uh, on that. I'd certainly take a motion to adjourn. Second. I oh, go. Oh, yes, move. Go. Well, you already seconded <laughs> so before moved. anybody yeah. moved. Move, move by. I'll, I'll move then. <laughs> move by Stephen, seconded by Susanna. Second. All right, thanks everybody. <laughs> <laughs>